Okay, so I, I want to welcome everybody. I'm so sorry we're running late, um, but I want to welcome each of you from around the world. We have, I think, about uh, 70, 65 or 70 people enrolled in our workshop uh, at the moment, and others will be joining in later, I'm sure. Uh, we're holding this workshop physically at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. And the people in the room here are mainly our Cure Americas colleagues uh, from uh, Bolivia, Guatemala, and Kenya, and we're very happy to have them. You'll be seeing and hearing from them a little later. Um, so the first thing I want to do is uh, have uh, Andrew Herrera welcome you. He is the executive director of Cure Americas, and we work hand in glove, uh, the two of us any different ways, and Cure Americas is one of our sponsors. So, Andrew, please say a few words, if you could. Yeah, I think that's okay, too. Well, thank you very much, Henry. The first uh, goal of the strategic plan is for Cure Americas Global to empower public health professionals. And so when Henry told me about this workshop, I knew that it fit perfectly with what we're trying to do around the world, with to make sure that people have cutting-edge training. And for 40 years, uh, Cure Americas has been on the vanguard of community health, and the reason of that is because of CBIO, a systematic approach to partnering with communities. Uh, Cure Americas is very passionate about saving lives and preventing unnecessary suffering, and to have healthcare heroes from around the world working together is a real privilege for us. So thank you very much, Henry, and for all of you for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. I wanted to give a special shout out to a number of different people in the organizations that are making this workshop possible. Of course, uh, Cure America's uh, Global is an important part of this, and through the donors to Cure America's Global, in particular, Wes Jones, who is our dear friend and benefactor, we're able to hold this workshop and provide the translation for you. Um, we have set up a small business, it's in its infant stage right now, called uh, CBIO uh, Global Health Initiatives, and uh, we have a new logo you'll see on the left there. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this in this room and at Duke if it weren't for the Duke uh, Global Health Institute, which uh, has been uh, very kindly willing to sponsor our work. I have been a faculty member at Johns Hopkins uh, for many years now, and I'm a part-time senior associate, and so uh, the Hopkins connection is certainly there. Um, we're very grateful to the Christian Connections for International Health, and in particular, uh, Hannah Fields and May Podjushink, who are on the staff of Christian Connections for International Health, but have volunteered to help out in the various uh, technical aspects of running a virtual and insight uh, workshop that's being translated into both Spanish and French at the same time. So we're very grateful to CCIH. I've been a long-term member there, and they're a wonderful organization, and I highly recommend uh, that to those of you who are interested in more grassroots-related uh, kinds of activities. And then finally, uh, Bilingual Communications Incorporated is handling our uh, translations, and we're very grateful to them for their help and assistance. Uh, just a word about our schedule. Uh, we're, we're, we were planning to break up into small groups uh, to introduce ourselves, but in the interest of time, we're going to have to forego that. And so we'll be able to start pretty much on time with the uh, first session, which uh, is an opportunity for me to share once again the basic principles of CBIO, which uh, I think are so important to go over again and again and again. Uh, then we're going to have a, a keynote address from uh, one of my global health heroes, uh, Dr. Abhai Bang, and then we'll have a little break, and then we're going to have a second keynote address from another one of my uh, global health heroes uh, named Ari Johnson, and both of the work of both of them is very closely connected to the principles of CBIO. We'll break for lunch for only 30 minutes, 
and we'll have food here available for people so we can go right ahead. And then uh, in the afternoon, the main activity is going to be giving our field people a chance to share their own experiences working with CBIO. And uh, most of that will be people in the room, but we'll have some videos that I've made of people who could not be here with us today. And then we'll end up with a 30-minute session on experiences from Bangladesh. I won't go into tomorrow's session or Wednesday's for right now. Sharing or keep sharing? No, I won't go okay. to the next lecture. Victor. <laughs> Make it big here. How do I do that? that here. I think so. There you go. <sighs> we received a request to remind people of the interpretation major. Can't see where the. What are you looking for? This, the oh, oh down, um, right here. That button right there. This one. Up, up, up a little bit. That. Nope, oh, right there. Right yep, here. Yep. Oh. Okay. Can everybody see this screen? I hope. Yes. yes. Principles of CBIO. Yes, we're on the stage. Good. Okay, yes, and. We're on the stage. Yes. So uh, I want to make this uh, session and all our sessions as interactive as possible. So uh, you can uh, type in a question in the chat box, and I guess some of you can speak. I don't know exactly how that'll work, but uh, if you feel like you want to uh, raise a question or make a comment, uh, we have built in time for that, so feel free to do that. Um, we have somebody who's keeping an eye on the chat box, so uh, hopefully your message will get through and uh, we can respond to it. So what I want to do right now is uh, review the key principles and practices of the census-based impact-oriented approach and then describe what we now call CBIO Plus, which is the traditional classical CBIO model, if you want to call it that with the addition of care groups and local birthing centers, and we'll explain what those are a little bit uh, later. And then we're going to talk about s some of the key ideas and the strengths of CBIO. So uh, one of my uh, basic uh, slogans that I bring up from time to time is relevant for this uh, talk, theory and practice are closer in theory than in practice. But uh, at this, having recognized that and, and having seen so many uh, problems in translating theory into practice, I still think the theory is important. The principles, the theory are important to keep in mind. We all know that uh, development work and health work in low-income settings is fraught with all kinds of challenges and difficulties. And so uh, trying to uh, adapt to the local circumstance, but with the basic theory in mind is, uh, is important and valuable, I think. Otherwise, we get drawn into all kinds of other issues that come up that are sort of side issues, in my view. So obviously, uh, we use the term census-based, um, and uh, there's, there is some disagreement uh, within our own family at Cure Americas about whether we should call this the census-based approach or the community-based approach. And I have continued to defend the term census because to me the term census means we involve every household in the program. The term community-based doesn't necessarily reflect that every, every household and every person is included in the program. So with the original terminology we used was census-based, and I continue to use it, but I recognize that other people, as they move along into this, will want to talk about the community-based impact-oriented approach rather than the census-based impact-oriented approach. But we, it's still CBIO, so it's not, it, it's not a, a huge issue. Um, we use the term impact-oriented because uh, embedded in the the key ideas of CBIO is the idea of 
measuring health within a defined population of people and assessing whether or not we've improved the health of that defined geographic population. And we'll get into more detail about how to measure health and how to think about it. Uh, but uh, there are many elements of measuring health, but one of them uh, and high mortality settings is a uh, deep concern about whether we're making an improvement in reducing the mortality of high-risk groups within the population. I like to think of CBIO as one approach to the practice of community-oriented public health. Um, we have published this in 1999. Uh, this was your homework to read this. Uh, I call this the sacred scripture of CBIO. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful, in my humble opinion, it's a wonderful article that grew out of uh, a lot of work and discussion among the authors that you see here, but was inspired by uh, Dr. John Wyan, who was our dear friend and colleague, uh, and I'll be talking about him later in the workshop. But the other co-authors on this are people that I was working with in Bolivia during this time, and uh, we're very fortunate to have Nat Robinson with us in the room today. Uh, we'll be hearing from Dardo Chavez uh, via video shortly, and uh, unfortunately, John Wyan is deceased, as is uh, Orlando Taha. Uh, <clears throat> CEA Winslow was one of the pioneers of public health in the United States back in the 1920s and founded the public health program at Yale. And he has this classic de definition of uh, public health, which you can see there. But, but the key words in here are organized community efforts. So built into this, in his view back in 1920, was the fact that public health involves the people themselves and they're thinking about what they can do together to improve their health. And we've kind of lost that concept in global health with the dominance of vertical top-down programs. So I wanted to bring that out for your attention now. Uh, John Wyan taught me that there are three types of public health practice, and you can think of this as three types of global health practice as well. Um, there are disease-oriented approaches, and there are services-oriented approaches, and their community-oriented approaches. And John Wyan's great insight is that we need all three of these, and they're like the three legs of a stool. And um, if one leg is weak, then we have a weak stool and a weak foundation on which to set uh, the health of the, of the public, so to speak. So we created this, uh, this virtual ideal three-legged stool, and we all know, most people think that public health is uh, basically vertical, top-down, disease-oriented public health. And that has been the dominant uh, theme in global public health, at least, whether it's uh, immunizations or family planning or HIV or TB or even child survival. They're all vertical, top-down programs that tend to be related to a lot of uh, donor support from other countries and very top-down directed at the Ministry of Health uh, in a targeted fashion in which the community plays a limited role. Uh, the second leg is services-oriented public health, and the goal of services-oriented public health is to get basic and essential services to people who need them. And that's certainly critical and important. The goal of the vertical top-down programs is to control a specific disease or a certain condition. And so those are pretty clear uh, in terms of their goals and purposes. And of course, uh, primary health care in all of its various manifestations is an important um, uh, part of uh, services-oriented public health. And community health workers themselves are another important, very important part of primary health care, but services oriented public health because they're trying to get basic and essential services to people who need them. And then there's this third leg that people haven't thought too much about and has been very weak uh, over the last uh, 50 years and even before that, called community-oriented public health. So the goal of community-oriented public health is to work with communities 
to help them improve their health. And that's what CBI was all about. It's a form of community-oriented public health. And as you see from the arrows here, they're all mutually reinforcing. Uh, but the, the stronger the community-oriented public health leg is, the stronger the other legs will be as well. But a very important part of all this is that these are not in conflict. We need them, and we need the top-down approaches. We need the service-oriented approach, but we also critically need the community-oriented public health approach as well, which has been very weak and underrepresented and underdeveloped. So this is the kind of stool we have in reality, uh, you know, from a very broad global perspective. Uh, a very strong leg on the vertical top-down programs, uh, weak on services-oriented and very weak on the community-oriented public health. So the overarching goals of CBIO are the development of a long-term partnership of trust and collaboration with, oops, with the community, uh, which is very difficult for externally funded programs. Um, this approach has never really caught on in the global health community because it doesn't fit well with the global paradigm of either very narrowly focused programs or the, the paradigm of short-term funding. Um, but it's inherent in what CBI was all about. The goal is the improvement of health of the community or a set of communities. So when we talk about the community, that can be conceptualized as a small community of 500 or 1,000 people, but it also can be conceptualized as a much larger population of people. Um, another key element is that uh, inherent in this approach is the demonstration using evidence, high quality evidence, that improvement has in fact taken place or has not taken place. That's important for the, for the um, CBIO approach. Um, it involves the consideration of the community or set of communities as the patient who needs an accurate diagnosis in order to prescribe an effective treatment, which can change over time. So the sort of thinking this conceptually as a doctor treating a patient, we have a program that's involved in trying to help improve the health of a, a community, but the, the idea is very similar. And in that sense, uh, it's important to be able to make a good diagnosis in order to provide a good treatment. And the time and effort that goes into making a diagnosis is worth it. My screen has frozen. Oh, here we are. Okay. Um, there are many different ways of measuring health. Um, obviously, mortality, as far as I'm concerned, is probably the most important. But in many settings, mortality rates are so low that there's not a lot that we can do to improve mortality, or the amount of effort involved in improving the mortality is so extraordinary, it, it's not really realistic to think about it. But in many of the settings in which we work, in which there are high levels of under five mortality and high levels of maternal mortality, uh, these are a priority for us to be thinking about. Uh, nutritional status is a very important measure of health. And science tells us that uh, undernutrition in children is a very important predictor of mortality, but also longer term development in terms of intellectual development and, and capacity later on. So the level of nutritional status, particularly among children, is terribly important. And then disability, which has uh, often been uh, neglected in our thinking as we were focusing on other higher priority items. Uh, one of the things that's uh, deficient in our article and your homework, and I've been thinking about this more recently, but uh, I, th I think that uh, within a population of people, two critical elements that are important for health are immunization status and family planning usage. 
And so I, I think those need to be brought in uh, at the beginning in terms of thinking about the health uh, status of the population. So <clears throat> the first thing involved in CBIO is uh, defining the priorities for the program, and there are two kinds of priorities that we talk about. There's the community's priorities as they perceive them and understand them, and then there are the epidemiological priorities as the partner in the program defines them using local data. And those may not be the same as the community's priorities. And so um, in order to make that definition, there's a need to have a relationship of trust between the health program and the community, and the community needs to be involved in helping the program define what these priorities are. Um, so <clears throat> the epidemiological priorities, this is another little pearl that I learned from John Wyan, and I, I, I like it a lot. He, he defined epidemiological priorities as the most frequent, serious, readily preventable or treatable conditions in that local population. So, uh, and, and there's a judgment involved in determining what those might be, but still the concepts are terribly important, I think. Um, an, another key element of this is that epidemiological priorities may vary from one place to another. So even though you may have high quality national information or information for a larger population, what may be the epidemiological priorities in this location where you're developing a program may not be the same as what they are on a larger scale. So <clears throat> defining the community's health priorities as well as the epidemiological priorities are the next two fundamental steps in the conceptual framework for CBIO. And then, of course, uh, being able to define what the baseline level of health is, which could consist of uh, what the baseline mortality rates are, what the prevalence of serious illness is, prevalence of serious disability, what's the immunization coverage rate, and what's the contraceptive prevalence rate. So those are not that easy to define, but it is possible to define them. And when we talk about mortality rates, we can talk about the crude mortality rate, which is the number of deaths per thousand population, but we also tend to think about uh, mortality rates in children, whether it's the neonatal mortality rate or infant mortality rate or under five mortality rate and the maternal mortality ratio. So this is the CBIO cycle. Uh, we start out with a developing relationship of trust between the program and the community. We determine the most frequent, serious, preventable or treatable diseases and what the community's health priorities are we focus our efforts on the highest priority problems. And then, uh, which isn't really reflected in here but should be, we think about the resources that we have available for our program. And then based on what the priorities are, based on the community diagnosis and what our resources are, we develop a plan. Uh, a detailed implementation plan is a phrase I like to use for this. And then we implement the program and we conduct surveillance, uh, monitor what's going on. And then at some later point in time, in the article we say five to seven years, we go through the community diagnosis process again, and then we start the whole cycle all over again. Uh, here's another s scheme of the, of the CBR approach that one of my students uh, made, which is uh, somewhat similar, not exactly the same. Uh, it shows here at the top identifying the program population through visits to all homes. And then over to the right you see focus on the uh, most frequent and serious preventable and readily treatable conditions. And that should also see the community priorities. Then we modify the program as needed to adjust to respond to the needs. And over to the left we talk about targeting high impact services to those at the highest risk of death, collecting census information and vital events registration, monitoring coverage, and then routine systematic home visitation is built into it. So routine systematic home visitation is a key element of what CBIO is all about. 
In order to define the community, you need to precisely define what the geographic boundaries are and make a map of who lives where, determine who the residents are, and determine who the high-risk population is. That's a lot of work. And there is no way that a program can do this unless they're working in collaboration with the community. And we'll see lots of examples as we move through the workshop of very large-scale programs that have been able to do this. So uh, in terms of the community diagnosis, just to review what I've already said, I think uh, this is uh, pretty, uh, pretty repetitious, I would say. Um, but just to repeat, using local data to term, determine local priorities is a key part of uh, CBIO, as I think is apparent now. So uh, we'll be talking more about how one might determine what the community's priorities are as they perceive them. And there's no standard approach to doing this. Um, but um, obviously, if you have a home visitation program going on, then that provides a wonderful opportunity to get feedback from each household about what they perceive their health priorities to be. Um, you can do it in a sampling kind of a way of uh, surveying a sample of households and asking specific questions. Uh, and you can uh, use focus groups and segmented uh, groups within a community, whether it's mother's clubs, groups of women, young women, older women, adolescents, older men. I mean, you can think of many different ways of doing this. Uh, you can even vote, and you'll see in our video in a minute uh, an example of a of a program where they ask people to vote on what their health priorities are. So I've repeated, I've already stated uh, pretty much everything that's on here, but in, in my view, uh, readily preventable or treatable mortality should be the first priority of a health program in a situation where there are high levels of mortality. Second priority on serious illnesses and disabilities, and I should mention nutrition. If there is a high level of undernutrition in children, that should be a priority too. One of the principles involved uh, with CBIO is um, in terms of measuring mortality, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and have a lot of practical experience with this, although I'm not a demographer. But there's so much value that can be obtained by registering vital events when you go from home to home. And to obtain mortality data through a sample of households through a survey approach requires very large sample sizes. And so uh, if you're able to contact every household in the population of your program and obtain those vital events, it's, you're much better off. So once we know what the epidemiological priorities are, and once, uh, then, then, and once we know what the community's priorities are, then we go through some ill-defined process of defining program priorities, which are some kind of combination of what the epidemiological priorities are and what the community's priorities are. And of course, we can only do so much. So uh, trying to figure out what should be the priority is, is a process which would vary from program to program. And then the development of a work plan would be derived by determining the available resources. And that's not just money, but there are so many local resources that come to bear, whether you're talking about staff, uh, community resources, people particularly, that can be used to address program priorities. Uh, I've already mentioned the importance of routine uh, systematic home visitation. Uh, when we started our work in Bolivia in the early 80s, um, People thought that routine systematic home visitation was a laughable approach for health programming because of the intense 
uh, amount of manpower that was required by it. But I would say over 40 years now, the value of reaching every home has increasingly been uh, demonstrated, and there are ways to do it without uh, having to spend a lot of money to do it. And <clears throat> Home Visitation Bills Trust provides an ideal opportunity for staff to get to know the community and learn from the community and vice versa. And it provides an important vehicle for service delivery, whether it's health education, uh, about healthy household practices, warning signs of serious illness, or for actually providing services. We have a long experience of immunizing children in the home, uh, monitoring uh, the nutritional status of children, providing family planning services, and even detecting cases of uh, sick children. So our second keynote address will be uh, from Dr. Ari Johnson, who has developed a world-class health program in Bamako, Mali, in which they uh, identify sick children through routine uh, home visitation. So uh, we're not going to talk about this today, but uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about care groups and local birthing centers, which in Guatemala we call casas maternas. Um, but just to very briefly mention them, um, we have had a growing experience with care groups as uh, many groups around the world have had, and it's, it's widely practiced throughout the world now through the NGO community, but not so much through the governmental uh, system of health care delivery. But a care group is a group of 10 or, or so women who each have 10 households. And the, care, the women in the care group meet with a facilitator to learn a message or two. And then during the following two weeks, the care group volunteer delivers that message to the 10 households she's responsible for. So it's a health education approach that has been very powerful. Uh, in the situation of Guatemala, where our program has been operating for 20 years now, and there are many situations like this around the world, there are no viable options <clears throat> for women to give birth in a well-developed health facility. And uh, a very high percentage of the births take place at home. And in the rural Guatemalan situation where we've been working for two decades now, uh, there were no viable options for women to give birth in a health facility. And so our program developed what we call casas maternas, which are local birthing centers, uh, which... Uh, so I hear a dog and people speaking, so somebody needs to put their microphone on mute, if you would. So... Uh, Cure America's uh, Guatemala has developed a, a very exciting program of, uh, of building with the community local birthing centers where women can go nearby to give birth, but with a trained attendant and with referral services that are readily available if the occasion merits it. So this is just a diagram of the care group cascade, as we call it, where you have one central source I have no idea what happened here. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, you're okay. There's many mouses on here. On here. Okay. How'd you do that? Um, this was just in the way, this thing. Yeah. Okay. I don't think they can see that. Yeah. Here we go. So in the care group cascade, you have uh, a central person who is responsible for developing the messages, and those are passed down to supervisors, who then pass them down to promoters, who then pass them down to each care group, and then each member of the care group shares that message with the 10 or so households that she is responsible for. And the messages have to do, they've been focused over the years on maternal and child health, so they have to do with healthy household behaviors, exclusive breastfeeding, washing your hands and so forth. But they also have to do with motivating people to obtain services from the health program, whether it's um, the importance of immunizations or recognizing the danger signs of uh, serious illness, such as uh, 
fast, uh, fast breathing uh, associated with pneumonia. So uh, I like to call care groups CBIO light, L-I-T-E, uh, because it enables a program to bypass some of the difficult early census taking activities and it can be implemented very quickly, um, but still uh, maintains uh, many of the principles that uh, CBIO has. And I'll, we'll talk more about that uh, as time goes by. But uh, another part of the care group process is that when the care group volunteers visit the homes, the 10 homes they're responsible for, they can also collect any vital events that occurred within their 10 households, a birth or a death, and then they can report that when their care group meets the next time. And it's a very simple way of having up-to-date, uh, on-time vital events monitoring, which if those of us who know about demographic and health surveys, uh, those are surveys that are only give you a picture of what happened you know, over the previous five years. It doesn't tell you what's happening at the present time, and this is a simple way to do it. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, the importance of uh, birthing centers in the Guatemalan context, and there are many other contexts around the world just like Guatemala, uh, has faced our, our friends in Guatemala, <clears throat> we were able to uh, identify that in the rural highlands of Guatemala, working with the indigenous Maya people, they had extraordinary levels of uh, maternal mortality, which had not been widely recognized before. And that was one of the reasons that we moved into the Casa Materna approach. So uh, here you can see, uh, some of the uh, factors that led to the creation of this, uh, some of which I've already mentioned already. Uh, this is a local birthing center, a Casa Materna in Guatemala. Uh, we were fortunate to receive a grant from the Ronald McDonald Health Charities Foundation, which uh, helped us with this uh, a few years ago. And uh, two of our visitors, uh, friends, uh, family members who are here today, uh, Juani uh, Valdez and uh, Alma Domingo, run these, runs this program for our uh, program in Guatemala, and you'll be hearing from them later. The important thing about, it, or one of the important things about the Casas Maternas is that it supports and includes the local traditional birth attendants, and they are uh, enabled to continue to work with their client, the pregnant woman, and the comadrona comes with her client to the birthing center and participates in the birthing process. And the staff at the Casas Maternas are very welcoming and supportive and affirming of the comadronas. And this is a new approach to this issue that I think is terribly important that has important global uh, implications for these kinds of areas around the world. So uh, the key ideas behind CBIO, uh, the long relationship, long-term relationship of trust between the health program and the community or set of communities, whatever you define it as, uh, the commitment of the program to work with the community in a collaborative partnership to improve health and demonstrate that health has been improved. The community diagnosis based on locally determined epidemiological priorities and community priorities and monitoring progress in improving health. And people still don't widely appreciate the importance of early neonatal mortality as a cause of death within many low-income settings. We'll talk more about that later. So other key ideas, as I mentioned, involve developing a system for identifying and maintaining contact with every household in the community, periodic measurement of levels of health in the community, including registration of pregnancies. So pregnancy is not technically a vital event, but it has a lot of value of identifying it because over time you can 
be sure to find out what happened in the pregnancy. So did the pregnancy end in a miscarriage? Was there a stillbirth? Uh, and, and the outcome of that pregnancy is important to keep in mind in the process of measuring uh, the health status of the community. So I think everything that you see on this slide has been repeated already. So focusing on groups at greatest risk and priority condition for causing ill health is a fundamental element also of the CBR approach. And then focusing attention and resources on these groups and conditions. So we have many examples now, and one of the things that was motivating for me early on in the belief that this was a powerful approach is the empowering effect it has on local program staffs. It gives them a handle, it gives them a lever by which they can think about how to spend their time, and it gives them the opportunity of being able to measure whether or not they're making progress in their work. And um, the whole idea of community partnerships and involving the community is also very exciting and empowering, not only for the program staff, but for the people themselves. And by having this uh, partnership with technical expertise that's brought in by the program, which is very low level technical support, very accurate information can be obtained that's useful to the community that can help them formulate a plan forward for addressing these priority problems. So <clears throat> I'm very um, convinced that uh, CBIO is a powerful approach for many reasons, but it has clarity and power in its ideas and vision. It links to key principles of public health. It has demonstrated the potential it has to help programs become more effective in improving health. It's a way of achieving high coverage of key child survival interventions. And it also readily lends itself to new interventions for community-based treatments as epidemiological priorities come along. And so as we look on a much broader basis uh, throughout the world, uh, it's becoming readily apparent to me that there are so many opportunities for applying these principles to non-communicable diseases and particularly hypertension in those communities where hypertension is now an epidemiological priority and where maternal and child health is not the priority that it used to be. And so we'll talk more about that as we move along. So <clears throat> I've decided on my own that CBI was a methodology whose time has come. And so I'm prepared now to begin to uh, stand on a on a top of a hill and, uh, and promote CBIO how I can. And this workshop is, uh, is uh, one of the first uh, opportunities to do that. And how we can help other groups, organizations, individuals think about these principles and applying them in their local environment is something that I think has enormous opportunity for all of us. And those of you who have signed up today obviously have some reason to have an interest in this. and so. It's my hope that through our discussions that we'll have inspired some of you, given you some new ideas about ways to think about what you can do to help improve the health of communities by helping communities themselves be more effective in improving their health. So uh, we now have uh, 25 minutes for questions and comments. And so I'd like to hear from any of you all uh, who would like to ask a question or make a comment. And you can speak in Spanish or French and we'll somehow get a translation out. Can't see. Huh? Once the top. Hmm?
That, that was better. But you need that one too. Uh, no, that's okay. That just okay. Okay. Uh, this is Kevin Kayando speaking, who is from Kenya and is one of the leaders of our Cure Americas program there. Uh, I have one question uh, on one of the overarching goals also of CBIO. In your first bullet, you mentioned that uh, uh, it's a near impossibility for, for externally funded uh, programs. Can you please uh, uh, explain further? Okay, let me see if I can go back to that slide. Oh, yeah. Thank you. This is it here, I think, right? The question from Kevin was if I could explain more about uh, why I said that the development of a long-term partnership of trust and collaboration with the community is a near impossibility for externally funded programs. And the reason I said that is because by their very nature, externally funded programs are short-lived. They're three years, four years, they're, they're not long-term. And the other thing is that uh, external funding is uh, geared towards demonstrating quick results and uh, it takes time to get this system up and running. And I don't know of any donor that would have any interest in uh, spending money to help uh, get something like this going over a three to five year period, which is what it really takes. And so this is one of the reasons why um, highly selective primary health care became so dominant in the early 1980s after the declaration of al Mata because it involved uh, very narrowly defined approaches, the results of which could be defined and uh, in e evaluated uh, in a way that uh, satisfied the needs of the donor. And so uh, there's a lot of tension between CBIO and externally funded programs, and that's one of the reasons why this whole approach has been slow to catch on. Does that help? Okay, any other question or comment? Hey, Please. I've got a couple of com uh, questions in the chat. <clears throat> okay. So the first question is from Dr. Bright Orgy. Uh, is there any difference between CBIO versus community directed intervention? CDI or CDTI used by WHO AFRO. Additionally, the ability for CDI uh, Just one second, yeah. let me answer that. Okay. So Bright Orgy is someone I know from Johns Hopkins who uh, has had a long connection with something called Community Directed Interventions. And uh, the Community Directed Intervention approach has been used widely across Africa to control specific diseases uh, such as onchocerciasis, river blindness, through mass uh, treatment of drugs, but it's, uh, it's been expanded to include some other activities as well. It's a, to me, um, community-directed interventions is a great example of a combination of a vertical program that uh, links into uh, service delivery, and also uh, community-oriented public health because it involves the community in the distribution of the drugs, and it also gives a lot of authority to the community in the way in which they distribute those drugs. So it has, it has a lot of interesting overlaps with CBIO, but I see uh, CBIO as a much more inclusive and holistic approach, whereas community-directed interventions start a priority with, a, with the disease, lymphatic filariasis or onchocerciasis. It doesn't start with the goal of helping to improve the health of a population in the way that we're talking about. So maybe you could think of CBIO as an extension of or a further development of uh, community-directed interventions. So what was the other question? Yeah, we've got at least three or four more questions on the chat. Uh, the, continuing from Dr. Orji, Additionally, the ability for CBIO to establish working relationships agreement with community and build fiduciary tru and trust 
is key to community ownership and sustainability. I'm just wondering how you manage the issue of incentives for community volunteers. Who is responsible for payment, program versus community? So the, those questions address uh, the practice of CBIO. Uh, this lecture is focused on the theory, the principles. And uh, all of those issues are obviously important, and they're going to vary from place to place, and it's not really possible to make any blanket statements about how to deal with all those. But we will, as we discuss specific examples of programs that use CBIO, we can get into that, I think. All right, so third question from the article, I read about two approaches, library and field. I'm just wondering if you have experience of mixed models, library plus field. Oh. Well, uh, the article says we need both. It's not either or. So the library reconnaissance is initial part of reconnaissance, which has two parts. There's the library reconnaissance and the field reconnaissance. So we need both. We need to find out what's been written and uh, is available information-wise about the health status, if not of that specific community, but the area in which the community is. And we need people to go out and interact with the people in the community to get a better idea of uh, what's going on. So they're not mutually exclusive, and we need both. The next question is from Mariam Chaudhry. How much do literacy rates affect CBIO activities? So uh, again, we're talking about principles and, and not specific applications. <coughs> CBIO can be used with illiterate people. Uh, yes. Could you please repeat the question? Oh. I can't hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize you couldn't hear what <coughs> Andrew was saying. <coughs> so the, <coughs> the question was, uh, how can CBIO be used with illiterate people? And uh, as I started to say, uh, we're talking about principles here, and so the question is, how can you apply these principles in any, any given context? And certainly uh, some of these contexts involve people who are illiterate. And we have many examples and much experience of applying these principles with illiterate people. Uh, and it can be adjusted and adapted to that environment. The next question that you'll repeat for me is, any experience applying TBIO to urban communities? It was one of the challenges of CDI in the prevention of on excuse me. I didn't hear the end of that. It was one of the challenges of CDI in the prevention of the disease. CDI? Community developed, uh, this is from Dr. Bright. Community directed initiatives. Oh. Intervention. Oh, yeah. So the question is, how can CBIO be applied in, in urban or peri-urban situations? And again, <clears throat> this, at this point in time, we're talking about principles. We're not talking about the application of the principles. Uh, but in fact, uh, our second keynote address will be from somebody who developed a home visitation program in a peri-urban area of Bamako, Mali. So you'll have an example of that. Uh, I'm going to show also a little later on this afternoon an example of BRAC's program in the urban slums of Bangladesh. So this is not an approach that's limited to uh, rural areas. And in fact, why does my computer keep doing that? In, in fact, one of the, I should have mentioned this in one of the strengths of CBIO, but one of the strengths of CBIO is that it can be applied anywhere in any setting. It's not limited to poor countries. It can be applied in the United States, although I don't know of any examples yet where it has been applied, but it certainly could be. No reason why it couldn't be. So the next question is from David Thompson. How are CBIO programs funded? coordinators, supervisors, et cetera. So uh, again, uh, yeah, the question is how are CBIO programs funded? And the simple answer to that is that they're not funded. Uh, 
we, we have had a long history of struggling to find money to support these programs, but the, the question is involved in the, in the application of the principles, but we're trying to focus on the principles right now. Uh, but just to try to answer the question, we can get into this more later, but it, uh, this is a new concept uh, that hasn't taken off, and so there's, there, there are not many examples of this program approach and Cure Americas has been working on this for 40 years, but with great difficulty in finding the funds we need to keep moving forward. So that's one of the great challenges is introducing uh, donors to this, but also I think another great challenge is to figure out how to apply these principles without any funding. So I think it's possible for local communities, if they had this type of orientation or somebody can help them lead this through, uh, an orientation towards this uh, approach, it could be possible to apply these things without any external money. Next uh, comment is from Dr. Jones. I think the importance of community trust cannot be overly emphasized. CBIO breaks down without trust. It would be helpful to hear from various pro programs any specific lessons they learned as to how they were successful or unsuccessful in this endeavor. So Dr. Jones, as emphasizing the importance of trust, and he says that he hopes that we will hear examples of how trust has been built up over time through CBIO, and you'll certainly have that opportunity. The next question is, do the cultural perceptions of community influence the implementation of communication for behavior change negatively and or positively? So the question is, do cultural perceptions influence behavior change communication positively or negatively? Yes. So again, uh, that's a question of application of principles. But by the very nature of CBIO being a community partnership, then involving local people with their own perspectives and understanding of their own culture, then uh, I think it's generally the case that these programs have been very effective in adapting the key messages and the approaches in a way that is acceptable and positive within the uh, local context. From Donna Sri Joshi, <clears throat> there are some areas in which they cannot record birth and death rates. How much will that affect CBIO? So the question is, there are some areas where they cannot report birth and death rates. So, the whole issue of registration of vital events is a complicated one and it's a sensitive issue. Uh, but if you're thinking of a system in which local people are collecting this information, it's a very different context from having an interviewer from the Capitol come into the community and ask a household, uh, how many births and deaths did you have in the last five years or over the course of your reproductive history, which is the way demographic uh, health uh, surveys are carried out. And so um, given the nature of CBIO and the embeddedness of it within the community, it lowers the barrier for, uh, for registering births and deaths. Uh, we have a lot of experience with the process of birth, of birth and death registration, and we've learned that it takes time to build up a system like this that's accurate, because there are people who are reluctant to share information, and particularly the issue of neonatal deaths and stillbirths is a complicated issue that takes time to sort out. So you can't start up a vital events registration overnight. It takes several years to get one up and running that's accurate. That's one of our lessons. I'm yeah. glad to have all the questions. They're great, so keep them coming. We've got uh, a few more minutes. We have two people with their hands raised. Can we try? Sure, give it a try. We can unmute. We sure. Uh, Saeed Arwal. You want to try to unmute? Yes. Uh, good morning to everybody, and I'm so happy that after uh, after. Uh, 30 uh, years to, to be again with uh, Dr. Henry Perry, and I'm very happy to hear from him. And uh, so everybody is welcome. And just I would like to say about the 
CBIO and also uh, community scorecard. See, so uh, could you, because I see some similarity between this, this two approach, and uh, could you just uh, explain me what's the difference between the uh, community scorecard and CBIO, because we are implementing CB, uh, community scorecard by help of uh, John Hopkins and uh, Dr. Edward and Barasi in Afghanistan. So could you just uh, tell me something about the difference between these two, two approach or tools? Thank you. Arwal, uh, thank you very much. It's great to have you in this seminar. Uh, Saeed Abib Arwal uh, is a great, is perhaps the great champion of community health in Afghanistan. And I got to know him many years ago through previous work that I had done, and he has provided leadership uh, within the country to develop a very strong community health program there. And uh, I'm a great admirer of what he's done and will do in the future as well. Um, I would say that community scorecards are a technique to help communities uh, assess what their priorities are and what the value of the program that exists at the present time is. So it's, it's a way, it could be thought of, I think, as a way of implementing some of the CBIO principles, but it's a technique. It's not a philosophy. It's not a set of principles. It's a technique, but it is an important way of engaging communities and helping them define what their priorities are and getting their perspective on uh, programs themselves. So thank you very much. Our next question is from Harriet Napier. You have your hand raised. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and hello, Dr. Perry. Thank you so much for having us. Um, this question is, is probably not answerable in a Q&A session, but I'm hoping that we can work through this a bit during the course of the workshop. And it seems also that this type of question has come up a few times already in the Q&A session. There are a few of us um, on the line participating from Clinton Health Access Initiative, CHAI, who sit on a malaria team and are funded to do malaria work. And though I would like to believe that our, our donors, our, our malaria donors, are quite open-minded, we are still you know, somewhat constrained and expected to focus um, on and deliver on malaria outcomes. Um, and we have an opportunity in, in Benin to explore some more kind of community oriented solutions and a few select um, high burden communities. But again, this is malaria funded work. And I guess the concern is it may not represent true CBIO. So I'm hoping maybe we can get some guidance from you on you know, what happens if we apply CBIO principles and find that um, communities are simply not interested in addressing um, uh, the disease that we're funded to tackle? Right? So, how do we address this or anticipate this concern with communities in the donors' life? Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Harriet. Uh, this is one of the one of the conundrums that we face at this point in time in global health how to help move towards a more holistic approach towards uh, strengthening global health programming and uh, how we can generate more interest and support and money at top levels to help uh, move this forward when so much money is tied up in specific programming, whether it's malaria or TB or family planning or whatever. So I can't answer that, but it'll be something that we can continue to discuss over the course of the workshop. Few more questions online. So uh, we've got maybe three more minutes because we need to move ahead with our next uh, session so that we stay on time, but uh, we can try for a couple more. Is it not too difficult to make home visits and get up information in urban settings when people are so busy? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, and the answer is, uh, yes, that may be true. We've had a lot of difficulty in some urban settings uh, uh, connecting with people, uh, particularly in La Paz, Bolivia, in El Alto. We'll probably hear more about this a little later. But uh, there, people leave early in the morning to go down into the city to work, and they don't come back till late at night. So 
if you uh, visit their homes, they're not there. And, and they also have big barriers around their house and uh, it's very challenging. But on the other hand, there are many other urban areas where people are readily available in the slums of Bangladesh, for example. Uh, uh, it's very easy to visit homes and people are there. They're there during the daytime. So um, we can talk a little bit more as time goes by about approaches to dealing with uh, urban settings where people are not either at home or willing to answer the door. It's a special case. So the next question is, can you incorporate CBI ideas in existing projects with care groups to gather health information to identify other health needs. Projects with care groups are usually only five years, so it would not be as long as the full CBIO cycle. What would you advise? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, and the answer is, of course. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the modifications of the CBIO approach that I've thought of, I've mentioned it to our own groups from time to time, but it hasn't quite caught on. But to use the care group approach to define community priorities as well as community uh, epidemi uh, community perceived priorities as well as epidemiological priorities using care groups before you even start a program. Because you have a situation where you're going around to visit with each household and having these people obtaining information from the people they're visiting, what do they think their priorities are and what, and based on vital events and other in, information you can collect by seeing if there are people with disabilities in the household, for example, it's a way of obtaining baseline information through the care group approach. I think it's got a lot of power to it. Okay, one last question. Can the concept be used in addressing diseases in livestock industry? <laughs> Can the concept be used in addressing diseases in the livestock industry? Well, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I, I presume it could be. Uh, I mean, it could be, the approach could be used to address other issues beyond health, other development issues, and we've thought about this from time to time, but never have given it serious attention. So I think I'm gonna cut off the questions now. I'm very happy with the questions that we had and we're gonna move on to the next uh, part of our program. So, so we're about to see a video uh, by two uh, pioneering uh, Indian uh, professionals, Abhai and Ronnie Bang, who are a husband and wife team. I've known them for many years. Uh, the Bangs have a, a similar route that connects to my root, my origins and beginnings, and they and they <clears throat> they go back to Dr. Carl Taylor, who was the uh, chairman of the Department of International Health at Hopkins when I was a student, and he recruited the Bangs to come to Hopkins to study, and their exposure there led them towards the work that they're doing now, in the same way that my exposure there led me to the work that I'm doing. So we have a a common bond that's very powerful, but the Bangs have done far more than I would ever can think of doing, so it's a great honor to have them here. So I'm gonna turn this uh, video on. It's, it's, a, it's an address that was made to the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, so it's got kind of a research focus to it, but all of the principles that they talk about are embedded in CBIO, uh, so when you hear that, think about how to use this data collection process for the benefit of CBIO, not necessarily for publishing in a journal article. Doctors Bong have received nearly 60 awards, including the Maharashtra Bhushan, the highest award honor of the Maharashtra state, and the Padma Shri by the President of India. They also received the National Award from the Indian Council of Medical Research, and they've been honored by Save the Children and the MacArthur Foundation. In 2005, Time Magazine recognized them as global health heroes. So these are people that have done extraordinary work. Dr. Abhaibang and Dr. Rani Bang will speak separately with Dr. Abhaibang speaking first. So I'm gonna start by introducing Dr. Abhaibang and Dr. Rani, if you want to take a seat. Um, Imagine if you could do work that reduced neonatal mortality by 50% and you were able to sustain that reduction, it would be akin to a miracle. Now, imagine this was all done through a home-based newborn and child care program. Dr. Zabhai and Rani Bang did just that. 
Dr. Abhai Bang was the lead researcher on a study in rural India which helped develop a new model for neonatal care in low and middle income countries. And the Bang approach has shaped national and global neonatal healthcare policies. It's been replicated in 10 countries and it's being scaled up nationally by the government of India. The research was selected as one of the milestone papers published in The Lancet in the past 180 years and included in vintage papers from The Lancet. Dr. Abhai Bang is a member of the Central Health Council of the Government of India, was chairman of the Expert Committee on Tribal Health of the Government of India, and is also on a number of India's National Health Commissions and high-level expert groups in health. But above all, he and Dr. Rani Bang continue their pioneering practical, transformative work in neonatal and women's health. ASTMH members are doers. Dr. Bong is an expert, a high-level international figure, and universally admired, but first and foremost, he's still a doer. Will you please welcome Dr. Abhai Bong. Professor Chandi John, other leaders of American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, delegates and friends. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you from this podium. You are the largest body of medical and public health scientists in the US engaged in the research and action on tropical health. Research is the key to new knowledge and knowledge is the new wealth. Who owns it, owns the world. Who shapes it, shapes the world. And hence the crucial questions about research in tropical health are where should this research be done? By whom and how? In today's brief keynote address, I intend to share with you two stories and then some reflections about these questions which I mentioned. Can I have the first slide, please? Yeah. I have titled my presentation Research with the People, and this two story happened in this place. You see this map of India, Maharashtra state within it. Bombay is the capital of Maharashtra state. Thousand kilometers from Bombay, at the eastern end of Maharashtra, you see the red area, which is Gadchiroli. Difficult to pronounce. Gadchiroli has been the theater of action for both of us for the past 33 years. Next, please. Very backward and remote area. Poorest in the state. More than half of the forest, uh, surface is covered by dense forest. Next, please. 1,500 villages scattered with huge distances, lack of transport, very, very less education, lack of health care. Such was the Gadichuli district 33 years ago when just returning to the India from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, we decided to go to Gadichiroli. The only reason being, we wanted to work in the place which needed us. Next, please. In the very second month of our work there, stay there, this girl was referred to me. She was referred to as a case, suspected case of rheumatic heart disease because she had murmur in the heart. But severe pallor, lepidosplenomegaly, and what you may not be able to see, mild icterus. And that jaundice made me suspect that this is not heart disease. And I thought of sickle cell disease. Sickle cell was never known in that region, that in that district earlier. We established a test. It turned out to be a case of sickle cell anemia. Now imagine a young researcher recently back from the US, first thing you think about is, ah, I have found something. I'm going to publish it. And we conducted a sample survey of the district. Samples were collected from 3,200 individuals, tribals, non-tribals, 
and we found that the 15 percent population had sickle cell gene as you can imagine mostly sickle heterozygous which is asymptomatic yet we thought it was a huge finding we invited health minister tribal minister political representatives next please next please and these findings were presented minister applauded us and said a new center on tribal medical research will be started in Gadichiroli and nothing happened. So we went back to the tribal leader, community leaders saying, look, problem of sickle is in you and government is doing nothing. Can, should you raise your voice? Tribal leaders looked at us very blankly and they said, next, they said, doctor, sickle is not our problem, it is your problem. Did we ever come to you and, and told you that we are suffering from something like sickle cell disease? You came and you asked for a drop of blood. We thought a young couple has come, why disappoint them? So we gave you a drop of blood. And that's all. You said there is a sickle, you found it, so you solve it. We have nothing to do with it. Ah. That was the first big lesson in the research that we got. And reflecting on this experience, we realized that we had committed a blunder. Next, please. Next, please. No. No. Previous one. Is there a slide? Yeah. Research should address the needs of the community I work with and not the research community I report to. Consciously or unconsciously, whenever we are thinking of research, we are thinking of publications, conferences, grants. But in that, we forget as to whose problem are we working on. Do they need it? We decided after this first blunder, I'm I am a little ashamed of this first piece of research of ours, though it brought us publication, awards, everything. But I am ashamed to say we conducted research on the people. We use the people for getting certain publications done. For search, our organization, Rani and I decided the policy, research policy, that hereafter we will not do any research which people don't need. And so, next, what do people need? We started going to villages, sitting around night fire, asking people what health problem they had and what did they need from us. We even, next please, invited what we call People's Health Assembly. Next please, representatives from s several villages came and we asked them what their health problems were on which we want, we should conduct research, we should help them solve. And then we actually had voting. And so women and people voted what they thought were their highest research priorities or their highest felt healthcare needs. And you'll be surprised, 30 years ago, these are the next please, these are the five priorities people gave us. Malaria, low back ache, white discharge amongst women, alcohol and alcoholism, and child mortality. For the past 30 years, this research agenda has been enough for us. We, we have worked on some of these, but a lot of things yet to be solved. And so let me sh share, go into little detail about the last one, child deaths. Next, please. We established a measurement system in 102 villages. In the first year, the infant mortality rate we found was 121. Neonatal deaths and childhood pneumonia were the main causes. Neonatal deaths, a difficult problem, but nearly 70% of the IMR was occurring in the newborn period. So NMR contributed 70% of the IMR. Next, please. Visited delivery rooms. At that time, nearly 80% deliveries in India occurred at home. 
So this is a home delivery room in a village called Murza. The woman has delivered eight days ago. You can sh still see her on the charpoy. And the newborn baby was taken care of in this way. Nobody else from outside was allowed to enter. And this mother and baby during neonatal period or postpartum period were not allowed to step out of that delivery room. So that dark delivery room was the black box. And 20 million neonates every year were born in rural area in this kind of situation. Of course, some of these neonates fell sick, but there were no hospitals. The global guidelines, WHO UNICEF guidelines at that time were that if a neonate is sick, it's a very serious problem, immediately refer to hospital. Gadichuli was 350 kilometers long, there was only one hospital. And these mothers and babies were not allowed to even step out of their room. So we decided to turn the neonatology upside down. And instead of babies going to hospital, hospital must go where the babies were. Next, please. And we designed a new model, home-based neonatal care, with the goal to develop a low-cost home-based model of primary neonatal care by using not doctors, by using not neonatologists, but human potential available in the villages. Next. She is Kajubai, a woman from village called Ambeshoni, seven standard education, but a lot of passion to do something, learns new thing, do something for her village. Next, please. 39 such women were selected from 39 villages, one per village. These 39 villages were intervention area of the field trial of home-based newborn care. 44 villages were control area. These community health workers that we selected, one from each village, were to become the barefoot neonatologists of Gadichiroli. Through a 30 days program, they were trained. Next, please. How to make home visits, ask history to mother, weigh the baby, weigh the temperature, and also help mother by way of health education. Next, please. Babies were weighed, preterm, low birth weight babies. There was no electricity, no incubators were attempted to be kept warm in this kind of. And next, 8% of the neonates developed sign symptoms strongly suggestive of neonatal sepsis. Case fatality rate was very high. So we trained these community health workers to give antibiotics when the baby met certain scientific criteria of neonatal sepsis. Now look at the impact. Outcome was neonatal mortality rate. Next, please. The yellow line is the control area where government programs continued, where we only measured once in a year, we measured neonatal mortality rates and infant mortality rate. From 1993 to 2003, for nearly 10 years, this area, the control area, represent the rural India, the whole of rural India. NMR remains somewhere around 60, with some random fluctuation. The blue line is the intervention area, 39 villages. The baseline NMR was 62. With home-based newborn care introduced, within three years it came down to 26. 62% reduction. The trial was over, but we continued this as a service program. And you can see even seven years later, the NMR in the intervention area is low, 70% less than the control area. Next. Who did this miracle? It's women's empowerment. These homes and huts in India were dark, remote, inaccessible. Mother was helpless. But open that one window of knowledge, training, opportunity, and provide this knowledge and skills to at least one person in the village. And that empowered woman, mother, grandmother, and the community health workers, they could lift the entire household's health and save the newborn baby. Next, please. This trial was published in the Lancet in 1999. It attracted a lot of attention. And subsequently, Lancet selected this as one of the vintage papers published in 180 years history of the Lancet. Next. Mm -hmm. 
with this credibility scientific credibility and several rounds of replication in maharashtra state then in india government of india accepted this in its five year national plan and introduced this through 900000 community health workers selected all over india next please we were asked to design training for 900000 community health workers training to deliver home based newborn care a structured program standardized program trained these community health workers all over india today it is spread in entire in entire of india except for two states where imr nmr was already very low so it, they don't need home based newborn care it has also spread to bangladesh to nepal to pakistan and several countries in africa last year government of india informed me that 11 million rural neonates in india received home based newborn care next few years later the global organizations who unicef usaid and save the children together brought out a joint statement that where hospital based newborn care is not available in developing countries world over home visiting and home based newborn care is the appropriate solution next please next please so with this experience one story of failed research of research on the people and second story of research on the topic which people suggested as the, was their priority i am going to reflect with you on some of the research questions which with which i began where should research be conducted new researchers when we want to start our career and work the first question is where should i conduct my research based on our experience i would advise next please go where the problems are next and not where you are problem <laughs> we usually we usually use the criteria of are there facilities for research but look the places with facilities don't need you there you become a problem there is there may be may not be any other health problem to solve except your employment and so better go where there may not be facilities but better go where the problems are there next how should i identify research problem usually we look into journals we see what other people are, have done are doing and then we often do research and we call it research but what gradually taught us that listen to the people next please listen to the people what are their needs and the research problems will spring up from that the earlier sickle cell disease people didn't need it it was our intellectual itch child death people needed it and look what happened from gradually it spread to globally next please how should i conduct research and this how is a very crucial question next please many of you might have seen this tragic photograph early 90s severe famine in ethiopia this severely malnourished starved child is about to die but before it is dead a vulture is already waiting there this photograph was published as the cover story of the news week and it received the international award of the photograph of that year a moving photograph but this sad second part was that the photographer who was awarded for this photograph committed suicide after 6 months his conscience asked him that you left that child there as such what did you do for that child you took a photograph rushed for publication and there only the child and the vulture was left next please and so the ethical dilemma in the present approach of research 
next researcher gets publication grant career growth next what about the people next today we often indulge in what can be called research on the people next please can there be a research approach in which people are also enriched empowered next please i would like to call that approach as research with the people how would you, we characterize it next people should need it next people should understand it next people should participate in doing it next people should use it next people should own it our first piece of research sickle cell disease is a sh is a shameful story that was an example of research on the people it led to nothing it deserved not to lead to anything but research with the people the home based newborn care is just one example but research with the people found out the appropriate problem a problem solving method in which people were involved they understood it they were empowered they solved the problem and they owned it and so the home based newborn care even 24 years after it was introduced is still continuing in the gadchurli and now it has spread nationally so it's everywhere in india next please final question could be will it produce impact research with the people may not have very high tech laboratories or may not have very high sounding researchers ordinary people would would be the main actors in that will it produce impact next please we already saw gadchurli to global and i i i wish to tell you that what archimedes said to 2000 years ago that give me a lever long enough and place to stand outside the earth and i can move the earth of course people at that time laughed and yet we know today that with the principle of lever what archimedes said was right if the lever is wrong long enough and if there is a place to stand outside earth weak hands of archimedes also could have moved the entire earth research with the people is that long lever and if we do research with the people that long lever generates such an enormous amount of scientific evidence and power that people sitting in gadchurli can move geneva geneva washington and london the earth can be moved next please the famous chinese saint tao te ching in that book lao tse says he advises go to the people live amongst them love them listen to them learn from them begin with what they already know and build upon what they have friends in our research approach if we can bring in tao te ching these guidelines we might end up with different kind of research and with different kind of outcomes thank you so much thank you uh dr abhay bang for a presentation that was inspiring challenging uh honest and just exactly the right way to kick this off now it would be a rare person that would have just as impressive a clinical and research record as dr abhay bang that person would be dr rani bang Dr. Rani Bang was a key contributor to the studies that Dr. Abhay Bang mentioned on neonatal infant mortality, and she's also made a landmark contribution to improving women's life as a gynecologist and a research scientist and a social activist. Dr. Rani Bang was the lead researcher of a 1980 study 
1989 study prevalence of gynecological mortality in rural Indian women that brought worldwide attention to the hidden gynecological disease burden in rural women in low and middle income countries. She's currently a member of the International Advisory Group on the Universal Healthcare, WHO, uh, and the steering group of the National Health Ministry of the Government of India. Dr. Bong's also been a member of several national and international committees on women's health and was a member of the National Commission on Population in India. Again, Dr. Rani Bong is an expert in all of these areas, but she's also there on the ground, still doing the work and inspiring girls in India to become doctors and scientists who lead the way as she has. Please welcome Dr. Rani Bong. Honorable dignitaries, first of all, I must express my hearty thanks and gratitude to the organizing committee for giving me this honor, this opportunity to be with you all and share some of my learnings while working with poor rural and tribal men and women in Garchuli district. Abhay just spoke about working with or doing research with the people. I'm going to speak about my learning, about listening to women. Why did I think of this? Who was my teacher, my mentor in this? I remember a widow, Rai Bai Dabole, landless laborer with four children. Once she came to our clinic in a village her, and brought her youngest daughter, three years old, who was seriously ill with diarrhea, fever, and severe dehydration. Baby needed hospitalization. But in spite of her repeated persuasion, she didn't agree and she left the clinic. I was so furious. I thought she was such a cruel mother. On third day, when we again went to the village, that baby was gasping. And just in front of our eyes, that baby died in our clinic. Her elder six-year-old sister was with her. Rai Bai was nowhere in sight. So we inquired and we were told that Rai Bai had gone in the field. We called her and I just started scolding her. Rai Bai just kept calm. And after some time she said, Madam, if you are finished, now let me tell you something. She said, yes, she is my daughter, I am her mother. But I don't have any land ownership. I had to weigh between my elder three children and this youngest daughter. If I don't go in the field, I cannot feed my other children in the evening. So today, I had to go to the field. I could not hospitalize the baby, but it doesn't mean that I don't have any sorrow or grief for my departed child. And that suddenly opened my eyes. We doctors, when we wear white coats, we think we are the white elephants and we know everything. We never try to understand what are the economic, social compulsions of the people. Not only in rural area, but I would say because I have worked in urban areas, also in urban areas too. And I thought that if I have to educate the people, I must first educate myself on how to educate them. And so listening to people, listening to women became my mission. I remember just now Professor Chandi mentioned about gynecological study. That time when we started the work in 1977, Maternal Health, Government of India has this national program of maternal and child health. But women's health was equated only to maternity and family planning. And through my experience of working as a gynecologist, I always felt that starting from menarche to menopause and even thereafter, women had so many gynecological problems. And when I searched in National Library of Medicine in Washington while I was doing my master's, 
I found that there was not a single study to show what was the prevalence of the gynecological morbidities at the community level. When I was inquiring with the women what was their major health concern, I talked to 100 CRE informants and 100% of them told me that white discharge was their number one health concern. And when I presented this to the leading gynecologists, policy makers, they just laughed at me. They said, what is there in white discharge? Why do you want to waste your time in studying white discharge? It's an innocuous symptom like nasal discharge. But women were telling me something different. I asked these women to enlist their major health problems and asked them to do the pile sorting exercise to divide this disease into most serious, moderately serious and mild type of diseases. And to my surprise, I found that 100% of the women put obstructed labor and infertility in the most serious disease category. I was surprised because as a doctor, the disease which leads to mortality is a serious disease, but infertility doesn't lead to any mortality. So when I asked these women, why did you put these two together? These rural women gave me such a fantastic answer. They said, Madam, if there is obstructed labor, that woman dies only once in her lifetime. But if there is infertility, she dies daily. This society doesn't allow her to survive. And then I thought that I must listen to the women. And then we did this community-based study of gynecological problems. And the results were shocking. 92% of the women had gynecological problems. On an average, each woman had four types of gynecological problems. 58% of the women had reproductive tract infections. So what women were telling me was absolutely right. What to do about these stunning findings? We first went to the people, telling them about the findings of the research study. And women started telling me, Madam, it's OK. We have these problems. But where can we go? There is no lady doctor everywhere in the district. I was the first one in the district to conduct the caesarean section. Till then, nothing was being done in the field of women's health in the district. And they said, you can't come to our village, so you please train the traditional birth attendants. These traditional birth attendants were already conducting the deliveries. And I was very upset. I thought, these illiterate women, how can I train them? These old women, how can I teach them? But there was no other alternative, so I started training these traditional birth attendants. And I can tell you, previously I had a very tunnel vision. Maybe I was a good gynecologist. But these traditional birth attendants and the rural and tribal women have taught me so much. I will give you just a few examples. When I say listening to people, listening to women, talking to them, how to talk, how to listen to their talk. I am sitting in OPD clinic, in the chair. One old lady comes to my clinic, stands in front, sits in front of me. I ask her, what is your problem? She doesn't utter a single word. She just shows her two fingers like this. I don't understand what she is trying to say because she is keeping mum. So I again ask her, again ask her, what is your problem? She keeps mum and shows me two fingers like this and ultimately I get annoyed. I said, you neurotic women, rural women, if you don't want to convey your symptoms, your problems, how am I going to treat you? And that lady leaves my room Yes, she leaves my room with her medical condition untreated, but at the same time losing faith in modern medicine. Actually, there was a chance for me to bridge a gap between traditional medicine, traditional knowledge with the modern medicine, but I lost this opportunity because I didn't know her language. She was talking in sign language. She was trying to tell me that she had prolapsed uterus 
women feel ashamed to tell about this symptom so they show this sign there is oblique language there is symbolic language they have got their own phrases they have their own ethno anatomy ethno physiology when a woman comes to the clinic and she she has white discharge she won't say i have white discharge she would say i have weakness and when she says weakness that weakness is not just physical weakness but it is sexual weakness too then i have to probe her that do you have a discharge and i have to examine her if she has infertility problem she won't say that i have infertility problem she would say i have black colored menses so they have their traditional vocabulary they have their traditional dictionary and i had to learn all this because otherwise i could not communicate with them i remember once i was during training i was talking to the tbs and asking them about stillbirths and 125 tbs from 85 villages whom i was training to treat gynecological problems all of them just flatly refused they said we have never delivered a stillbirth baby and initially i thought they were telling me lies to keep up their image but when i probed then i understand understood that their perceptions about the anatomy and body physiology were very different from what we were ta taught in the medical school in medical school we are taught that for the process of labor to occur three factors are important power passage and passenger in rural area there is no concept of power there is only concept of passenger and passage and they think that the baby comes out with its own bodily movements so this women asked me madam if that baby dies inside the uterus how can it come in outside it come can't come outside so it has to be alive maybe for one or two seconds till it comes out and then it dies and then those tbs told me that here you people you misunderstand us and then they told me that you doctors you gynecologists when you see any pregnant woman you give iron tablets folic acid tablets calcium tablets and you tell us that you eat these tablets your baby will be chubby and they said we just throw these tablets in the gutter because we don't want our babies to be chubby to gain weight and they explained to me that the obese people are very lazy so and thin people are very active so if the mother eats these tablets and the baby becomes chubby it will just sit idly inside the uterus and will not make any effort to come out side of the uterus and that will lead to obstructed or prolonged labor so so many things they have taught me otherwise it would have been very difficult for me to communicate with them i remember when i started training this traditional birth attendants i told them that i will teach you something and in exchange you have to teach me something it should not be just one way process and because it's a forested area and i am interested in forests i told them you please teach me about the trees in the forest and in i remember in one of the sessions one tba told me doctor this particular plant is used to kill the husband and i i was just looking at them i said why do you want to kill your husband i had never heard anything like that before and the women started telling me that you so if he is involved with someone if i am involved with someone if he is abusing me to get rid of the husband we can use this plants and they started telling me the recipes they started quoting the instances where women have killed their husbands like this and suddenly we thought that these women have been living in the forest since ages and they have a very special relationship with the trees and so for next two years i traveled in the whole district met various key informers traditional healers and try to understand the trees their uses starting from roots to the seeds medicinal uses household uses but i realized that all the relationships which are very important for any woman world over 
लाइक मदर डॉटर रिलेशनशिप फादर डॉटर रिलेशनशिप ब्रदर सिस्टर हजबेंड वाइफ टू सिस्टर इन लॉस टू सिस्टर्स लवर्स रिलेशनशिप ऑल दिस रिलेशनशिप आर डिस्क्राइब इन रिलेशन टू द ट्रीज देर आर डिफरेंट ब्यूटिफुल स्टोरीज देर आर सॉन्ग्स एंड आई जस्ट कंपाइल्ड ऑल दो थिंग्स आई डिड इट ओनली फॉर माई इंटरेस्ट बट वन ऑफ द पब्लिशर्स इन महाराष्ट्र लीडिंग पब्लिशर ही वॉज अवर फ्रेंड ही विजिटेड अस ही सॉ दो पेपर्स एंड ही सैड रानी आई एम गोइंग टू पब्लिश दिस इन द फॉर्म ऑफ ए बुक and that book was published in marathi local language govind means friend and to my surprise it got the state's best literature award now see i am not a trained botanist i am not a trained anthropologist i never knew anything about the trees whatever i learned it was all through this traditional birth attendance and that's why i am here today I remember in one of the camps one old TB a tribal TB she took me aside and she said doctor you have to do something about criminal abortion and what she told there are traditional quack abortionists who go to the villages on cycle or motorcycle and conduct abortions at home and the fee they extract is not only in the form of money but they indulge in sexual intercourse with that girl or with that woman before and after performing the abortion and i was aghast in a country in india since 1972 we have a very liberal abortion law anything can fit into that up to 5 months we could do abortion but legal and illegal are useless terms that what i realized what mattered to women was availability or non availability of the services in that whole district i was the only gynecologist legally allowed to do medical termination of pregnancy so we started working on that and when we presented these findings of gynecological study we said that these are all the missing links in reproductive health of course family planning is very important but family planning program should not be for target oriented population control program it should be for the better health of women and children if we want to cut down reproductive tract infections we have to provide safe easily accessible abortion services we have to provide safe easily available delivery services and the last thing in that study we found that 50% of the unmarried girls whom i examined had premarital sex it was not a surprise for me because as a gynecologist i always saw this type of patients in my clinic and when i talked to the parents mothers of these girls who had premarital sex they said madam this is under reporting you should do something for our children educate them on sexuality and educate not only the girls but the boys also so that they can behave in a responsible sexual manner and that's how we started adolescent sexual health education program so so many things we have learned from them as abhi told malaria is very rampant in our area filariasis is also very, very endemic in our area and when we did this gynecological study men started coming to us and telling us why don't you do this type of study on us and to test their seriousness seriousness because for this community based study we have to examine all symptomatic as well as asymptomatic men so to test their seriousness we asked them to collect the signatures of the men in the villages and to our surprise we found that within 2 days 300 men came to us with a statement sign that please do this study on us and it was the point of maximum gratification for us in a traditional society where it's a taboo to talk about sexual matters here men are coming forward to and asking us to conduct this type of study we did that study and we found that 24% of the males had hydrocele 
which was due to filariasis. Now what to do about this hydrocele? So we started operating on them because that surgical treatment is needed. And then men started, women started coming to me. Hydrocele is not just the problem, inguinal hernia is a problem. Women started telling me that breast lumps, menstrual problems needed hysterectomies. They brought their children with pediatric surgical problems and they said we need surgery for these children. They came with backache problem and this, and we realized that some of the people needed spine surgeries. So we started this program of providing camp-based surgical care in our hospital. And doctors from all over Maharashtra, very distinguished doctors, they come over there and do these surgeries and it has helped tremendously the local people. So everything, because we were trying to listen to them, I think our life enriched and we could do better work. So I urge this very august gathering. The title of our program is Tropical Medicine. I like to urge you all Instead of just saying tropical medicine, can we say medicine for the people living in tropical areas? It should be connected somewhere. And when I say people, at least 50% of the population in tropical area comprises of women. And females have their special priorities, special problems. Filariasis, when we think of filariasis, we only think of swelling on the legs or hydrocele, but in Garchulia, while working, women used to come to me with big breasts, swollen tender breasts, which were filarial breasts. That was a very different problem. And so I urge you all that please, you are already doing a lot of work in different countries. I know there are many female researchers in this hall and all over the world. Fortunately or unfortunately, women in developing world or in tropical countries, they feel more comfortable to talk about their personal sexual matters, other problems. They, they are more comfortable with the female doctors or female researchers. And so there is a great opportunity for so many female researchers in this area who are working all over the world. So whenever you go to the people, whenever you go to the women, I would say, instead of just starting the measurement, instead of just counting the women, start listening to them. And they may give you very different insight. Thank you so much for inviting me and Thank you so much for listening to me. Okay. I hope uh, I hope you were as inspired by that as I have been, and I've seen this many times now, and I continue to be greatly inspired. Can you? I don't know if the echo is still coming through or not, but uh, we're very honored that Dr. Abhai Bang has joined us uh, live from Gacharoli, India. Abhai Bang has been a dear friend of mine for many years now. We're soulmates. Uh, I sit at his feet and listen to him and continue to be inspired. And Abhai, we welcome you to this gathering of uh, some 75 people now who just, as you know, have watched your video. And um, we'd like for you to just say a few words to start with, and then we want to give people a chance to make comments or ask some questions. So thank you so much for joining us. And I told them before our video started that you and I are soulmates because of our common roots that go back to Carl Taylor and our uh, deep appreciation of what he taught us that has helped us move forward. So uh, thank you so much for being with us and say a few words and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Henry, <clears throat> for connecting with uh, keen minds who want to... As Henry mentioned, 
we, we were disciples or students of Professor Carl Taylor. Unfortunately, Rani could not join today because a few months ago she had some severe episode of illness. So she expresses her regrets and conveys her greetings to you. Now, what we have been practicing in Garchiroli and uh, what you heard just now was the keynote address that we gave at the American Society of Tropical Medicine's annual event. But we thought it was a good beginning to share with you the importance of listening to people and also conducting any intervention or any research. But it must be for the people and with the people. So what Henry calls CBIO, we call health care with the people, research with the people. And what we shared are only the, the two stories, but I hope that they, they convey the essence of the approach and that approach is respecting the people, listening to the people, giving their priorities and felt need as the highest priority and designing systems which are pro-people, where people are empowered to deliver health care rather than becoming more and more dependent on doctors and hospital and medical insurance scheme. And along with this, if evidence is collected, data is maintained, then that local action often leads to wider implications, wider impact. Now, what both of us talked, Rani and I talked about, are not merely personal stories. What we shared with you is a method. And it is the power of the method. There is nothing exceptional about either about Gadichuli or about us. Communities ex exist everywhere. And health workers, activists like you and I, we exist everywhere. Question is, how do we interact with the people for solving health problems? It could be a technocratic one-way approach where medical people stand at the highest pedestal and they dish out health care. That, that, that is usually the global medical model practiced everywhere. But there can be this different approach with Dr. Henry, Professor Carl Taylor, and many of many people like us David Werner. So all, the, all that we are trying to do is to bring people to the center of healthcare and designing healthcare, which is people-centric, which empowers the people and makes them capable of taking care of their own health. Just to go back to the, the stages that I mentioned, Research on the people, not very justifiable. Research for the people, research with the people, and finally research by the people. We can apply same thing to healthcare on the people, thrust upon the people, centrally planned, delivered by government or medical bodies, and thrust upon the people. Medical health care on the people, health care for the people, health care with the people, and health care by the people. CBIO, in my own limited understanding, is an attempt, is one approach, is a name for an approach which, is, which has universal applicability. And uh, I stop here. I'll be glad to take any questions about either this approach or whatever I talked about. Thank you. Can I can I can I have a uh, not question? Just I want to hear something from you, sir. Sure. Okay. First of all, thank you so much. I'm so happy after after I think. Uh, 14 years, uh, I saw you. We have been your guest, uh, but uh, 
Dr. Uh, uh, Tyler in, in, in Gertuli, and we, we meet and we visited your center and your all the, the, the health activities and service, what you are doing there, and we learn from you people. I am from Afghanistan. I am Dr. Arwal. I am the founder of Community Based Healthcare in Afghanistan, and now, un unfortunately, I am in the United States in Harvard Universities. Mm, because of, uh, unfortunately, I said because of the situation in Afghanistan. So, uh, just uh, could you please uh, just a, a big issue for the community based healthcare activity in the world? I think that is. Uh, uh, payment for the community health worker because as in 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 population of the India this is millions of community health workers I think or a uh, hundred thousand I don't know how much of the but this more in Afghanistan also we have we have had 10, 30 thousand of community health workers and so uh, what about the payment for them this is the issue or the volunteerism is it not the big issue for you dear or what are you you are finding and understanding and advice to us thank you sorry i didn't get your question did you ask yeah. about the payment to community health workers yes volunteerism is a big issue or not that okay uh this is a very sensitive question Donors or the NGOs like us expect people to contribute and we think that that contribution should be in the, in the form of voluntary time. But look, all of us are fully paid professionals. We have our needs taken care of and we are expecting that one woman the 39 women that you saw, the women like Kajubai, no, we, we can't expect them to work entirely voluntarily. And so we believe and we practice also that our community health workers are paid on part-time basis. Usually, our community health workers on an average work for two hours per day. Mm -hmm. So this varies on day-to-day -day basis. But average, it is two hours per day. And uh, they get appropriate compensation commensurate with their daily wages in the village. In reality, that's a small amount because wages in the villages are low. So we do pay them on part-time basis. In India, Government of India has selected and deployed one million community health workers. They call them ASHAs. Yeah. And, and Government of India has adopted similar pattern that we have been practicing in Gadchiroli. Payment them as a part-time worker on the amount of work that they have done. So there is no fixed remuneration, but mostly it is work-based remuneration. There are problems with this also. So I'm not saying that this is, this is very, very problem-proof way, but within several other models, we find this is the most appropriate. So you can't expect them to work 100% voluntarily. But actually, even if you pay them on only part-time basis, the cost of care drastically comes down because their payment requirements are much, much less than the doctors or nurses trained elsewhere. Okay, thank you. I'm pleasure seeing you after so many years. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to saw and hear the video and you. So I appreciate that and hope sometime we we again meet you, inshallah. I, I, I wish so. Person who just asked that previous question was Dr. Saeed Abib Arwal, who was a student with us when I worked at Future Generations, and he has been to Jamkid with our students uh, when we came from Future Generations uh, up high and he's been a leader of the community-based primary health care movement in uh, Afghanistan for two decades. We have a chat uh, question that came through from Dr. Bright Orji from Nigeria. 
Uh, and his question is, uh, Abhai, I was just wondering how you and Ronnie were able to get the government to collaborate and integrate your research to policy and practice in India. Well, it's a long story. And uh, it's not as rosy as it might seem. The rose had a lot of thorns also. But I think there was a window of opportunity when child mortality was very high in India. And we, we could see that priority a little 10 years earlier, especially the neonatal mortality. And the solution that we developed was low cost. It showed that it was widely used by the people and communities. It showed impact, very hardcore impact. And that that field trial met the international standards of science. And so journals like Lancet very highly appreciated it. But in spite of that, government of India very wisely, I should say, replicated that in the five states. We assisted Indian Council of Medical Research to replicate this approach in five states. And again, the control field trial in five states showed that this was feasible and it reduced neonatal mortality. And after that, evidence with a lot of policy advocacy. Science is the most powerful advocacy tool, but things sometimes just remain in the journals and only researchers read it. So you have to give it a voice and a, a, a planned advocacy approach with the Government of India Planning Commission and Health Ministry enabled this. But it happened because Government of India was also looking for a solution to the problem of child mortality. India had the largest number of child deaths in the world. It was a national shame. And so we arrived with a solution which was feasible, practical and proven. That's how probably it got acceptance. We had, uh, we're going to have one more question. We're running uh, behind uh, because of technical issues we've been facing all morning, but we'll take one more question. And I understand that David Thompson would like to ask a question himself. So David, can you unmute yourself, please? In our program in Adamawa State in Nigeria, the community health workers do not receive a salary. We make a microloan funds available to them for their own development projects. And that has been very, very successful. And despite the fact that they don't receive salaries, the work is so popular that we can hardly keep up with the new communities that are asking again. Just a comment. Thank you. So I don't know if you all are hearing all the feedback that we're hearing. Were you able to understand that, Abhaya? Good. So uh, do you want to respond to that or would you like David to try to articulate his question again? Or was he it said a comment? A, he said it's a comment, not a question. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that, David. So I think we'll stop this now. Abhai, we thank you so much for joining us uh, late in the evening from Gacharoli, India. Thank you for your passion, for your work, and the enormous contributions you made towards global health. So thank you so much, and good evening. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just have, I just one, have question. one question. Oh, OK. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. OK, uh, good evening, sir. I'm from Maharashtra also. I just wanted to ask you. Hello? Yes. Hello. We can hear you. Is it useful if we use primary data in our research area or not? Could you repeat that? We could not understand it. Can you explain a little more? 
Uh, if I speak in Marathi, it will it will be more comfortable. <laughs> Should I? I will be, but not the other people. Okay, no, you should answer in English. No, people should know the question. But if I you are difficult, you, if... you can speak in Marathi as well. I'll translate that. It will be more comfortable to give that accurate point of my question. Okay, go ahead. Now, my last question is that the एरिया मध्ये रिसर्च करायचा आहे त्यासाठी जर आपण तिथला प्राइमरी डेटा यूज केला तर ते यूजफुल राहील ओर नाही शी इज आस्किंग अ क्वेश्चन दैट इफ यू वांट टू डू रिसर्च शुड यू यूज द प्राइमरी डेटा इज इट यूजफुल ऑफ कोर्स इट इज वेरी यूजफुल एंड अनफॉर्च्युनेटली लॉट ऑफ रिसर्च इज नाउ डेज डन व्हिच इज अ व्हिच based on secondary data it is a research done on the desktop it's also valuable but especially for the young research the best approach i would suggest is to really go to the people listen to them and collect your primary data that will be unique in the world so primary data conducted by researcher is definitely very valuable it's a very very useful way okay sir thank you so much so let me make one final comment and that is that cbio is not aimed at research cbio is aimed at helping communities improve their health if there turns out to be a byproduct that can be published and considered as research that's great but this is all about working with people to help them improve their health and helping them see whether or not they improve their health that's what abhai refers to as research with the people thank you very much abhai thank you henry thank you very much thank you okay good night good night we're so honored to have you here today. Um, our second keynote speaker is Dr. Ari Johnson, who is one of my global health heroes. He's been working in Mali with an NGO called Muso for two decades now. And through the types of principles that we uh, embrace with CBIO, he's been able to share with the world some amazing results. And I wanted you to be able to hear this as well. So. Ari, thank you so much. He's joining us from New York City. He is an associate professor at the University of California in San, uh, in San Francisco and also spends a lot of time with his NGO in Mali. But today is at the UN General Assembly uh, advocating for community health. So Ari, thank you for joining us. So please go ahead. Thank you, Henry. You're one of my global health heroes. And um, I am so grateful and honored to be here with all of you, uh, particularly this gathering of practitioners so committed to census-based impact-oriented care. Can you all hear me all right? Are we good? Um, yes, Henry, we can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you. So looking around at the participants, in this room, both physical and virtual, um, I, I feel hopeful about the future of healthcare because CBIO is, it's more than a set of methods. Um, it's more than a technique. CBIO calls us to redefine the moral mandate of healthcare. And during our time together, I, I want to share my reflections about this new moral mandate that CBIO calls us to. And uh, to share also my experience, my team's experience, um, implementing and being inspired by CBIO methods uh, and how those methods have impacted my own path, our team's path at MUSO over these past 16 years. So first I, I want to tell you about Koke. So Koke uh, is a five-year-old boy who I met near my home in Bamako in Mali in West Africa. Uh, when I met Koke, um, is this little kid with beautiful eyes and a very distended abdomen. 
Um, and uh, his dad came and asked me to examine him. And uh, when I laid my hands on his uh, belly and his abdomen, I was, I was alarmed because his abdomen was hard, like, uh, like hard in clay um, and immovable. To any physician, that, that is a, a dire sign. And uh, we investigated and uh, Koke, I soon learned, suffered from a nephroblastoma, a cancer of the kidney that can occur in childhood and that is almost always curable when it is caught in time. And I sat with Koke and his father as they shared their story. Uh, Koke's father explained that uh, they're from the Segu region of Mali, a couple of hundreds of, mi of miles away from uh, Mali's capital, Bamako. And uh, Koke's father uh, farms maize there. Um, and he noticed, Koke's father noticed at the very beginning of the rainy season um, that uh, Koke wasn't feeling well and something was wrong. His abdomen looked off, looked a bit bigger than usual. And he knew even then that Koke needed care and he wanted to Koke care. He also knew that he was alone in his fields, uh, right on the edge of the Sahara Desert in, at the beginning of a very short rainy season. And that is a short and unforgiving rainy season. Um, and because it's so short, even a few days missed in your fields during rainy season can cost you an entire year's crop. So he knew that he did not have the money to pay the fees uh, out of pocket that uh, would need to be paid to get coke care. Um, and he knew that even if he took out loans that maybe he could or couldn't repay eventually, that he could not afford to leave his fields. If he left his fields to get coke care um, in the capital, then um, coke and his entire family might not eat in the coming year. Um, he might not be able to feed them regularly. So every day, Koke's father, he explained to me, went out to the fields and took care of his maize and grew his maize. And he also um, did his best to take care of his son. Um, and he, as he watched his son's abdomen grow and grow and grow to greater and greater concern and alarm, such that the very day he finished his maize harvest, uh, Koke's dad took his son in his arms and he rushed uh, to the capital where he uh, found our team and uh, where we found each other. And unfortunately, despite his haste, his urgency, and his determination, uh, by the time uh, Koke and his father reached us, it was too late. The cancer had grown and spread too far and metastasized. It was it was unreceptible, and Koke died shortly after uh, we met. To honor Koke's life, and um, and to honor and speak truth to the way the unjust way that he died, we must ask a question. We must ask: When does our responsibility to each other begin? When does the responsibility of a healthcare system begin? Most healthcare systems, including many that I've served in as a physician in the United States and abroad, uh, consider our responsibility to begin the moment a patient walks through the door of a clinic or a hospital. As healthcare providers, we often measure ourselves based on how we care for the patients who come to see us, who walk through our doors in our facilities. This passive moral mandate for healthcare fails the patients who we care most of and perpetuates inequities in care and drives millions of preventable deaths per year. What about the patients who never make it to the doorstep at all? Uh, what about patients like Koke who eventually make it to the doorstep but arrive far too late? We know that Koke's death was no accident. It wasn't the product of malice or some nefarious plot, but it was the product of design. Koke, he died because of the way the healthcare system around him was designed and set up. A healthcare system that charged fees that his father couldn't afford to pay, 
that required his father to tra travel many miles to reach a qualified provider who could make the diagnosis and provide the treatment he needed. So we know it was no accident. And we know that today, inspired by the trailblazing work of CBIO, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to do something different, to build a new moral mandate for healthcare, to affirm, and this builds very much on what Dr. Bang was just talking about, that our responsibility to patients and communities begins not when they walk through our doors, but when we walk through theirs, or even more so the moment that they need care wherever they are. And when we recognize this, together we can reset the goalposts, redefine what we're trying to do so that we are working to improve outcomes across entire communities, taking a census-based approach as CBIO calls us to do. Um, we measure our failure and success, not based on how we do for the patients uh, in facilities, but rather on whether and how much we are able to bend the curve at a population level for everyone. A census-based approach requires us to care as much for, the most for the patients who otherwise get missed, the patients who cannot make it to the door, who would otherwise arrive far too late, like Koke. And when we change the moral mandate, when we affirm that healthcare systems must care for everyone. This then redefines uh, everything that comes. It redefines um, how we should be designing and setting up the healthcare systems around us, what we should be building, and who is best placed to teach us how to do it. This brings me to the second key insight that we can gain and that our team has benefited from CPI uh, on. And that insight is that patients must be our professors. This is a an, an point also that builds from what Dr. Bing and Dr. Bing were speaking about. If we are to strive to change health outcomes at a population level, to reach those whom status quo healthcare systems are missing, then we must learn from the experts. And those experts are the community members themselves who face um, the injustices of our common concern. No one understands the barriers that they face better than they do. Um, so for the past two decades, I've had the opportunity to serve an organization called MUSO, founded as a collaboration between Malian and American doctors. Um, and we began our work uh, some 16 years ago by moving in with communities that uh, we serve and accompanying hundreds of patients as they struggled and too often failed to access the care that they needed at the time, um, our neighbors in Mali. We interviewed uh, patients, we interviewed our neighbors and had them tell us their entire life histories from the moment they were born to the moment that they or their child needed care and then in great detail to describe their path to care, struggling and too often failing to get the care they needed. And what they did is they mapped for us the healthcare system in front of them. In that process, they um, very kindly and patiently explained to us doctors that we had not only misunderstood the nature of the solution, we had profoundly misunderstood the nature of the problem. You see, we had come in thinking like doctors and uh, as doctors we were thinking uh, disease by disease. And we thought, okay, epidemiologically, Malaria, a leading cause of illness and death, let us build a malaria prevention treatment program. And as we were setting this up, patients and community members, they explained to us that they didn't have a malaria problem from their perspective. Um, they also didn't have a pneumonia problem, a sepsis problem, a diarrheal disease problem, or a cancer problem. Their, their problem was healthcare system that was designed to exclude and delay them because they were poor. And no matter what disease that they had, uh, cross-cutting barriers to care, fees they couldn't afford to pay, distance they couldn't afford to travel, providers without the training, infrastructure, or equipment they needed to make the diagnosis or provide the cure. And they mapped out these barriers for us. They taught us. And based on that map, 
that patients and community members drew for us, we had a blueprint and we were able to design a different kind of healthcare system, which we now call proactive community case management or rapid care. Now, um, this approach, rapid care, uh, proactive community case management is designed to reach every patient with exceptional speed early within the first moments that they need care um, and, and to ensure that care is high quality. Um, the approach starts with professional community health workers searching for patients door to door, deployed in every village, every community um, to find patients who need care and bring uh, diagnostics and therapeutics to the doorstep. They also identify and triage uh, patients with danger signs, the sickest and most complex patients, and then they, they evacuate those patients by off-road ambulance to redesigned uh, primary care clinics where the infrastructure, the equipment, and the staffing are all redesigned for rapid quality access. Third, across every level of care, we've removed all out-of-pocket fees. Um, the um, obstacle that uh, former um, director of the uh, director general of the WHO, Margaret Chan, called the greatest obstacle to universal health care, those point of care fees were both delaying and preventing access. And so we've removed them at all levels of care to ensure that no money changes hands at point of care. And we uh, then investigated uh, taking another cue from CBIO, uh, which demands that uh, we, and recommends that we look at outcomes at a population level. Um, so we conducted annual household surveys, um, which allowed us to measure an array of key outcomes, um, both at baseline and every year thereafter. And then uh, we were able to um, analyze those results and, and together with our government colleagues and community partners uh, and publish together those results in BMJ Global Health in 2018. And uh, here's what we found. Uh, the, our primary outcome of interest in, in this uh, seven year study was under five mortality rate. Uh, our hypothesis was if we could reach patients early, could we improve child survival um, improve outcomes, not just for one illness, but for many illnesses at the same time. Um, and so we saw at baseline that under five mortality was amongst the highest rates in the world, 154 per thousand life births, sitting right on the national trend line in Mali at the time. Uh, and then after the launch of proactive community case management in this, uh, the study area, this series of communities, the rapid care communities achieved um, a profound decline in child mortality from 154 per thousand down to 28 per thousand or below, ultimately reaching a rate of child mortality of seven per thousand live births, roughly on par with that of the United States and lower than that of any country in Africa. Um, so these partner communities th did something unprecedented. unprecedented. They created uh, outlier results. But we know and we believe uh, that those results are not outliers. And we're now working with the government of Mali and the government of Cote d'Ivoire um, to integrate the insights from this research and from larger scale subsequent studies that uh, we followed on with um, into national policy and practice. So this week, world leaders are convening here in New York for the UN General Assembly and for a UN high level meeting on universal health coverage. And so this week, um, the work of the CBI workshop is uh, particularly important because I think here in this room, we can affirm and we need to affirm that to reach UHC, we need to first redefine the moral mandate of healthcare. And we can use the census-based impact-oriented approach to commit ourselves to every community member, to hold ourselves accountable to ch changing health outcomes, to bending the curve at a population level for everyone. Inspired by CBIO, we can change and prioritize who we're listening to, ensure that 
every time that we consult, when we seek to learn, we're seeking to learn first and foremost from patients and community members. And they are our guides, our professors, those leading the prioritization, teaching us what it takes to reach everyone. And then with their guidance, we have this great opportunity together to design and build healthcare that meets patients where they are uh, with great speed. Um, and even in the most challenging contexts. Um, and, and that I believe through CBIO is how we get to UHC. And that's why I'm excited and hopeful being here with all of you today. I'm excited and hopeful for what we will build together and what we will continue to build together in the days and years to come. Thank you so much. Sorry, that was terrific. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. So inspiring. And uh, what a contribution you have made. Uh, when Ari and I were uh, talking and planning of this, I told him that uh, I had heard through the grapevine a couple of years ago uh, that, well, let me back up and say that when the results that Ari was talking about were published, in 2018, it made a pretty big splash. It was uh, going in the news and so forth, it made the New York Times, I think, and it created a lot of interest. And uh, I heard through the grapevine that Bill Gates uh, heard about it and probably even read the article. And what I was told that he said at the time was that if these results are true, the Gates Foundation should be investing all of its resources in this approach. Obviously, that didn't happen. And when I was talking to Ari about it, he said, he said, well, the problem was that nobody believes it. So we still have a long ways to go to uh, get this uh, methodology really moving into the mainstream. But uh, without pioneering work like uh, Ari is doing, it's hard to move forward. But we, we do, and with the bangs work too, of course. So uh, it is changing things, but unfortunately, it takes time. I want to give an opportunity now for any of you who want to raise a question or make a comment to please go ahead and do so. So you can do that in the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll try to make the mic available to you if you can unmute yourself. So Andrew, do we have anything yet? So uh, please ask a question or make a comment to Dr. Ari Johnson. Question in the chat, where does your funding come from? Oh. So, obvious question, where do you get your money from? Great question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, that has evolved over time. Uh, we began this work, uh, uh, this group of uh, Malian and American doctors, um, and on a volunteer basis, working out of a converted storage closet um, with, with a few thousand dollars we cobbled together. Uh, accompanying patients one at a time. And um, we now serve half a million patients uh, across two, two nations and are supporting those two nations on national health care reform efforts. So we've, we've done some growing. We're still in the scheme of things small and have a lot more growing to do. Um, so our, our budget is now about $20 million a year to do that work. Um, uh, relatively modest amount for, for how much uh, is possible with that money. Um, and we get our fortunate to get support from a community of partners, um, about 50 different partners, a combination of um, private foundations and corporate foundations, um, individuals, and uh, a bit from uh, larger institutions. So we get a bit of funding from, from the Global Fund and Gavi, um, in um, uh, Grand Challenges Canada, USAID, um, and um, most of our funding is still coming from um, private foundations at this point. Um, yeah, it's, so it's a, a diversified coalition of folks, um, and we're still learning how, how to do that. Um, I, I'd say that a big focus of our efforts as well these days, especially our technical assistance colleagues who are seconded to our Ministry of Health Partners, is helping our government partners mobilize resources, both domestic and international. Um, because we live in an abundant world. There is no reason, there is no excuse for at least 
this level of care to be invested and offered to every single person on the planet. It is, um, it, causes, it costs a shamefully small amount of money. Um, and I say shameful because um, it's, it's just embarrassing to, to mention how, how little money it, it costs to do this uh, compared to the abundance of our world, but, but we have to talk about it. Um, I, I do believe we can make a lot of progress and we are making more progress. We, I just came from um, a gathering uh, advocating for more investment um, in this space. Uh, we have the new Africa Frontline First Initiative uh, driving more investment in community health as well. So um, we're making some progress and we have much more to do. So uh, one, one quick comment is that in today's Lancet, uh, there's a commentary by uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs with me as a co-author, very proud co-author, uh, which says that uh, the low-income countries of the world need financial assistance because they can't do it on their own to meet the cost of basic health care and the amount that's needed is 5% of what we spend on armaments in the world today. So just to echo what Ari said. We have a Harriet Napier with a question. Okay, so Harriet Napier, who works with the Clinton Health Initiative, would like to ask a question. Harriet, go ahead. Thanks very much, and thanks so much. Um, thanks, Ari. It's great to hear from you. Um, I'm curious about the the sort of shift that you've seen within the government's approach in Mali. I know you mentioned a little bit about this. Can you speak a little bit more to uptake of learnings, you know, regarding proactive community case management and rapid care as a concept by the government? Maybe what have been some of the biggest wins in this respect and what have been some of the biggest barriers? Thank you. Fantastic. And it, it seems like uh, Lashan uh, Selby also had a, a similar question. Um, and uh, great to hear your voice, Harriet. Um, uh, thank you uh, for uh, this great question. So, um, you know, we have had the opportunity to accompany our partners in the Mali Ministry of Health now uh, for the, the past 16 years. And I think I'll attribute the uh, fruitfulness of that partnership to um, a few things. One is that from the very beginning, we did this work and research hand in hand. Um, and uh, so it, nothing was done in parallel. Uh, all of the studies we've worked on and published and are publishing, uh, they're, they're co-authored uh, with our Ministry of Health colleagues, they're co-owned, we're doing this work together. And, and so that creates much more direct pathways uh, to translate what we learned into policy and practice. Um, there uh, was um, a really uh, fantastic uh, culminating moment in, in a way in 2019 uh, that uh, your team, Harriet, actually at uh, Chai, uh, worked very intensively on uh, supporting the uh, Minister of Health and the President um, to make a uh, this, big national healthcare reform commitment, uh, which included many of the strategies uh, that we had tested together with the Ministry of Health over more than a decade, um, and that had, had just come out in the study. Um, and unfortunately, shortly after the president made this national healthcare reform commitment, he was deposed at gunpoint. Um, and th there have been a number of successful coup d'etats, uh, the the uh, government um, has faced a number of obstacles, including a sanctions uh, crisis and uh, ongoing presence of Al Qaeda and the Islamic State, uh, amongst other um, actors. Um, ha uh, close to half the patients we serve are in an active war zone, uh, in a conflict zone right now. So it's a very challenging environment. I'll say that even despite that. Um, Last year was one of the most fruitful years, perhaps the most fruitful year for our partnership with the government of Mali. Um, I'll say first um, areas that have struggled to move forward, I'd say user fee removal has um, been a more difficult battle to, uh, uh, to advance on, uh, particularly because um, 
with the sanctions crisis and uh, the ongoing uh, war in Central and Northern Mali, the fiscal space domestically is very constrained. And uh, right now there isn't a global fund for user fee removal. There, is, there aren't dedicated financing mechanisms. We're thrilled that our friends at the Global Fund and, and increasingly other institutions are starting to adjust their financing mechanisms to be more open to, to removing point of care fees. I think these are important first steps and that we can keep building on. But uh, this piece has uh, been uh, the most stalled of the national health care reform effort is the user fee removal piece. But um, we've got some plans in the work for 2024 to uh, reawaken that piece and, and get things starting uh, to move and scale. Uh, so uh, very cautiously hopeful that we can take some steps toward there. The piece that has been racing ahead uh, in Mali has been uh, on the professional community uh, health worker front. Um, there, um, we've seen the government transition to um, a role that, uh, of, of pro providing justified skepticism based on past experiences to the role of a convener, to the role of a regulator, and now to a role of the primary doer, the primary implementer. And the government has become the primary recipient of global fund funding, of Gavi funding uh, for its national community health system. Um, and that system has now integrated many of the key strategies I, I just described and is committed to integrating more. Um, so we've uh, seen uh, community health workers professionalized across the country. Uh, we've seen uh, every community health worker have a dedicated professional coach deployed uh, using uh, systems based on research we've done with the Ministry of Health uh, that are evidence-based. Uh, we are now seeing a national digital health platform go out uh, nationally um, across Mali to support those supervisors and community health workers. So some pieces of, of the agenda, some uh, pieces that we've tested in through this and other um, bodies of research are moving forward in exciting ways in Mali. And thanks primarily to the courage and uh, tenacity of civil servants uh, who have partnered with us in this work and who ride these waves of uh, conflict, of challenge, of adversity, um, with real dedication and focus to why they're there. I don't think we give civil servants enough credit uh, for uh, how much they bring to the table. Um, and, and now we're also on a journey with the civil servants and, and leaders in, in the Warian government, as they've um, we've supported them to launch a new national community health strategy this year that integrates a number of exciting evidence-based approaches. Uh, so uh, making some progress still, uh, many more steps to come, a long journey ahead, and we're looking forward to it. Thank you, Ori. Uh, we're 15 minutes over schedule, but maybe we can take one more comment or question, if there is one. One in the chat is, how did you make it possible to remove financial obstacles? Did you have compensation mechanisms at those health facilities? Okay, so the, the question in the chat is, how is it possible to remove user fees? That's, that's such an excellent question, uh, Albert. Thank you for raising it. Um, I, I think um, there are a number of, way, of ways that user fee removal can go sideways and go poorly. And one of the ways is that if you just remove the fees and you don't invest in the system uh, instead of the fees, then free care becomes no care. And that is a real, real danger of poorly designed, poorly invested, poorly implemented. Uh, user fee removal. We've seen this happen in a number of contexts. It actually happened in Mali shortly after independence, uh, where they uh, committed to free care, but then um, due to a number of political transitions, uh, there there wasn't investment in, in the 70s and, and, uh, and early 80s in the health system. And so people associated free care with no care. Um, but that is uh, really instructive to us because it shows us how important it is for us to think about this healthcare financing reform as a moment of investment, not just a moment of removal. Um, so key is costing out what are the human resource costs, projecting what uh, are going to be the increased human resource needs and uh, commodities and infrastructure needs and making those investments up front. Um, there are a number of healthcare financing mechanisms to do that, to pay for it. Um, 
uh, you could um, use a, uh, for example, a capitated uh, method of, of paying uh, facilities per person that they serve, for example. Um, we found that an input space method, essentially a budget-based financing method that with reconciliation uh, is the one that uh, removes any adverse incentives the best. So it's essentially uh, healthcare clinics uh, get assigned a budget um, based on, num uh, on a number of very specific uh, parameters and um, they get direct funded for their costs and which are then reconciled based on uh, true costs uh, before then uh, with the next funding cycle. Um, so it's an input-based uh, micro plan budget financing mechanism that we use. Um, but um, many uh, different health systems take different approaches to it. Um, there isn't one right way. It's just a matter of understanding the risks and benefits and strengths of the particular mechanism you use. The key piece here is that we have an abundance of evidence that those point of care fees are poison. They increase mortality. They drive families into poverty. They increase inequity and they do not drive efficiency. In fact, they drive inefficiency in the system. So they're not an effective means of cost recovery. Um, so we've learned all this through this immense body of research, including by Nobel laureate economists. Uh, so now it's for us to um, actually build it into practice. Um, so uh, that's, that's a brief version. I'll put my email in the chat uh, here. Um, would be thrilled to hear from you with additional questions and additional thoughts, ideas, feedback for us, uh, experience of yours that could be instructive uh, to us and uh, to stay in touch. We'd love to learn more from what you're doing. Uh, thank you everyone and thank you, Henry. All right, thank you so much. That was wonderful. We're very grateful. So uh, we're gonna move right ahead to the next session. And of course, we'll be delighted for Ari to join us, but he's got many other busy things to do too. So uh, the next uh, item on the schedule is uh, a presentation about the history of the development of CBIO. And I need some help from my uh, trusty assistant here, Barbara Mufaletto, to help me get started on this next session. So I want to take a few minutes just to share the background of how CBIO came about. It's a very interesting history. And I already mentioned earlier that there's a, a, route, uh, a route that goes back to Professor Carl Taylor at Johns Hopkins at Abhai Bang and I both share, and I'll explain a little bit more about some of that in a minute. My screen does not want to move. I'm being, uh, being tormented by some little devils in there somewhere. It's did you do that? that little button right this? Yeah. Okay, so I wanna talk about some of the early influences uh, that led to the formulation of CBIO and some of the early experiences in Bolivia that contributed to the formulation of CBIO and then um, overview of some of the later experiences and influence that have uh, shaped it as we move forward. Uh, so, uh, I had the privilege of being a Master's of Public Health student at Johns Hopkins in 1970, some years ago now, and uh, at that time, uh, Dr. Carl Taylor was the professor and chairman of the Department of International Health at Johns Hopkins. Uh, this was the first Department of International Health in the world, and uh, he came from a background that was very much focused on the kinds of principles that flow around CBIO. Uh, his parents spent more than 50 years as medical missionaries in the northern, uh, northern India in the Punjab. And Carl himself, when he was five years of age, uh, would go around into the villages with his parents uh, helping uh, uh, prepare medicines. And so uh, community health uh, was part of his DNA and uh, formed the way that he thought about things. Um, in 2004, I had the privilege of uh, working with Carl Taylor directly in his last few years of life as the Carl Taylor Professor for Equity and Empowerment at Future Generations. Um, so I had that early background. In 1979, when I was uh, 
still a resident in general surgery, uh, I had two months uh, of elective time and I, in a very uh, serendipitous kind of a way, I ended up visiting the Hospital Albert Schweitzer in Haiti. And it was that experience that I saw for the first time a census-based program in which services were delivered to every home and they were able to show that their under five mortality rate was one quarter of that for the country of Haiti. And when I saw that, I said, this is what I want to do. I had read this monograph that you see here that was published in 1980, um, which was a review of the world's experience in assessing whether programs had actually and measurably reduced mortality in children. And there were only 10 in 1980, there were only 10 programs. And uh, the result of the, the primary conclusion of this was that we have 10 programs where they have demonstrated that by getting basic and essential services out to every household, we can reduce under five mortality in three to five years by a third or a half. And so their conclusion was we need to learn how to do this on a larger population scale. And so when I went to Bolivia in 1981, my goal was to create a program that would reach 200,000 people and demonstrate whether or not we had reduced under five mortality or not. I had the great privilege of learning about Warren and Gretchen Berggren who had started the uh, census-based program at the Hospital Albert Schweitzer in 1967. And I got to know them. I was living in Portland, Maine at that time. And the Bergens were teaching at Harvard at that time. And so I got to know them and they embraced me because of my interest and concern. And through them, I got to meet their mentor, a man named John Wyan, who was uh, finishing his career and teaching at the Harvard School of Public Health. So here is John and uh, he, he worked with Carl Taylor in North India in the Punjab in the 60s and uh, early 70s, carrying out a pioneering uh, census-based research study in which they visited every home and in which they measured mortality rates and did a careful analysis of what was causing mortality in Northern India. And through that experience, it was a a uh, seven-year project of visiting every home, and then he spent 10 years writing up the results. And through that whole experience, he became a firm believer in the idea that home visits were a very powerful tool, not only for epidemiologic surveillance, but also for delivering services. And so when the Berggrens had a chance to begin the community health work in Haiti, uh, they asked John Wyan to be their mentor and he helped them achieve the results that they showed in Haiti. And so through my getting to know the Bergens, they introduced me to John Wyan. And when I moved to Bolivia in 1981, uh, John was uh, very much uh, supporting me. And he came down to Bolivia twice for one month at each time to work with us in the very beginning to uh, start a program that followed along the lines of uh, what the Bergens had done in Haiti and based on his early experience in North India. The other thing I should say about this is that uh, the Kana study, which is the work that John Wyan led, ended up being the foundation of another seminal community health project in, in North India that Carl Taylor led called the Neringwal Project. And that was an inspiration to the Bangs in their work. It was also an inspiration to the JOMCAD project, which we're not going to talk about much today, but is very much related to what we're doing with CBIO. But importantly, the woman who directed the community health portion of that work ended up going to Bangladesh in the early 1970s and started training community health workers there that in my view has led to a transform transformation of the population's health of 160 million people in Bangladesh. We're gonna talk about that this afternoon. But anyway, uh, you can see here uh, John Wyan to the left and my dear friends Warren and Gretchen Bergen to the right. 
Uh, Warren, unfortunately, has uh, passed on, but Gretchen is still alive and well and 90 years old, and I keep in touch with her, and I'm hoping she's going to join us. I've had trouble communicating with her in the last few days, but uh, she's been invited, and I hope she'll give a few parting comments because we still talk about how important uh, CBIO is and how important John Wyan was. So here's a picture of Carl Taylor. Uh, Carl Taylor was a world-renowned leader in global health and is widely believed to be, but he never admitted it, the, the primary author of the Declaration of Almaty. He was a close friend of uh, Hafton Mahler, who was the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization and uh, also a close friend of uh, Jim Grant, who was the head of UNICEF. And so he operated at very high levels, but also had his mind and heart at the grassroots level as well. And John Wyan and Carl Taylor were lifelong close friends. And I managed to merge into their orbit, which was very special for me. In the high mountains of Bolivia, in the most remote villages, healthcare as we know it is almost non-existent. Early in his career, Dr. Henry Perry lived and worked alongside the indigenous people, providing health care services. I wanted to be a medical missionary. That was my original calling. And I wanted to be out there helping and feeling the pain that people had and, uh, and being with them and addressing their medical problems. He's always wanted to uh, reach people who are very vulnerable. And we often find there's vulnerable populations in areas that are hard to reach that are uh, sometimes very dispersed. Every day you came across people who had enormous medical problems that you knew could be prevented or could be treated if the proper program were set up that didn't require expensive or sophisticated uh, medical services. He realized that just the skills that he had, even as a surgeon, weren't enough to reach the number of people who needed medical care. So that kind of inspired him to start an organization and train community health workers and address the problem more from a public health perspective. Dr. Perry devised a delivery plan centered on using local community health workers, neighbors really, who would routinely visit and teach basic health care practices. Henry is seeing the fact that the majority of healthcare delivery takes place in the household. Many behaviors could be practiced in the home that would save children's lives if only people had that knowledge and that sort of data and understanding of what to do. By developing close relationships with the people, healthcare workers can create programs that meet local health needs. After several years, the community noticed dramatic changes because of Dr. Perry's project. Yes, I remember before the project came, many children died, especially the very young ones. The project has helped our community very much. Through Dr. Perry's NGO, Cure America's Global, his methodology was implemented in Guatemala, India, and Africa, and all proved to have the same powerful impact on health care. Lives were saved. Dr. Perry left his clinical career to devote more time to research and writing about his public health strategies. What he realized was if you want to have an impact, you have to go beyond a given one patient, one doctor interaction. If you want to affect the health of a population, of a nation, you, you have to think on a bigger scale, and that's what he's done. He's been one of the preeminent, say, researchers who's been able to write about it and gone out and collected the data to prove that this approach can work, and then published it in science. That was where we started in uh, 1981, and uh, we encountered enormous uh, problems and obstacles, which we won't go into here. But uh, slowly, uh, the methodology that we developed uh, gained steam. And I've mentioned already that it takes a long time to get something like this going. And this was the first project of this type in Bolivia. And there was a lot of uh, pushback of, uh, from all corners uh, to, to do this. But we managed to keep going and do it. And then uh, we also were able to develop uh, two other projects in Bolivia. So you see here on this map, our work on the Altiplano of Bolivia, 13,000 feet high, 
is in the uh, western portion of Bolivia along the Peruvian border. Uh, we started another project near the city of Cochabamba in the Cochabamba Valley in CPCP and Marco Rancho. And then we also started uh, a project in the lowland area of Bolivia in the tropics uh, in a town called Montero. And you'll be hearing from uh, some of the people who have been involved with this uh, for a long time. Unfortunately, the uh, leader of our work in the Cochabamba Valley has uh, uh, become deceased and uh, we don't have any representatives from that project which uh, no longer functions, unfortunately. So uh, through this uh, mentorship that uh, our work in Bolivia had with John Wyan, and also importantly through uh, some grants that we were able to get from the United States Agency for International Development and their uh, child survival program, we were able to get funds to start the kind of work and to continue it and to expand it that uh, we were trying to achieve that were based on home visitation and community health workers. And um, after some years of this, uh, I became convinced that we were onto something important. And so I was able to convince USAID to give us a chance to uh, write up what we had achieved and uh, they requested that we form an expert review panel as well to take a look at that. So this is just, uh, this is a slide which shows the mortality rates uh, in the area of Kirabuko in 1992, which is a graphic demonstration of how important uh, under five mortality is, but more importantly, how important the mortality is of children in their first year of life. So you see in this slide, about half of that mortality is among uh, children who died during the neonatal period, and the other half is afterwards, and a much smaller number of deaths after the first year of life, and very few into the second year up to the fifth year of life. Uh, another important thing that we learned early on was that there was a dramatic difference in the cause of death depending on whether we were looking at the data from the highlands of Bolivia and the mountains uh, compared to the lowlands in the tropics. So, uh, and then we have uh, the Cochabamba Valley as a kind of a, 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 a medium uh, level of uh, effect as well. But I'm gonna just focus for the moment here on comparing the Altiplano of Bolivia with the tropics in Montero. And so you see here, uh, the under five deaths that were caused by diarrhea was very small on the Altiplano, but extraordinarily high in the lowlands in the tropics. And on the other hand, uh, pneumonia was a very important cause of childhood deaths on the Altiplano and a much smaller cause of deaths in the, Mon in the Montero tropical region. And then we had this very high a cause of death that we could never quite figure out what it was uh, that we called asphyxia. But I have uh, later decided that this was really hypothermia, which wasn't recognized as an important cause of death at the time. But we call it asphyxia at the time, but you see how important that is in the highlands, uh, in the Altiplano, and what a low cause it is in, uh, down in the tropics, non-existent, and much more malnutrition down in the lowland. So this was an example of some epidemiological principles of how uh, the epidemiological priorities vary from place to place. So um, we made a lot of progress with a lot of hard work starting in uh, 1981, but it took us uh, 13 years to get to the point where we really were able to share this with the rest of the world. And, and um, we were able to publish uh, the mortality impact of our work uh, that was based on data from uh, 1989 to, or from 1993 to 1994. I'm not gonna go into the detail here, but it shows that uh, in our intervention areas in Kirabuco and Marco Rancho, 
the coverage of these services was much, much higher than it was in the comparison area which we had developed at that time. Uh, just uh, for example, uh, you see the top row there, um, the uh, percentage of uh, children who had a card, a, a child growth card with vaccination information on it, it was 95% in our intervention area and 31% in the comparison area and 18 to 28% nationally. If you go down um, to the bottom row, you see the receipt of three or more growth monitoring during the previous 12 months among children 12 to 23 months of age, 80% in our intervention area, 8% in the comparison area. And so we had this data as well as the data that uh, demonstrated a dramatic decline in mortality of children. This these were in relatively small populations, uh, but we were able to show a reduction of over half of under five mortality that was also statistically significant. And so, um, as I mentioned, we were able to get a small grant from USAID to further document and write up what we achieved. And AID uh, requested that we form an expert review panel to pass independent judgment on the value of CBIO. And we had an amazing expert panel here of academics, uh, high level uh, policy people from UNICEF and donor agency from USAID and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what the conclusion of the expert review panel was in 19, 93 was that they thought CBIO, CBIO was worthy of further development and further uh, funding for uh, testing the approach in other countries. We were spending nine dollars a year to provide comprehensive primary health care services and they thought that was too much, uh, which was a big disappointment, but that was, they were comparing this to the cost of a vitamin A tablet and other things like that. And so they thought they could use their money better through highly selective, very targeted vertical programs. And they thought that uh, it was not uh, practical to be able to scale this up. And they thought that um, uh, by using paid lower level workers that for routine home, systematic home visitation that led to higher cost and dependency in the community. And it was complicated and time consuming. So it was a, a little discouraging to put it mildly that we had developed all this. And, and the other unfortunate thing about it was that AID had no interest in investing in this anymore. The head of child survival uh, for USAID, Dr. Al Bartlett was on our uh, committee and he carried a big stick in his opinion, of course. So that was unfortunate. Um, in 1995, uh, I moved to Bangladesh and uh, left the work of Andino Healthcare and started a new career. And I'm gonna be talking about Bangladesh this afternoon, but uh, I saw there the power of home visitation and female community health workers applied on a vast, massive scale. And uh, I became even more convinced that what we were doing was a powerful approach. And it had such success in, in Bangladesh. And so it, uh, it fostered my uh, commitment and passion for this approach. At the same time, during this period, care groups emerged uh, as a very effective approach for expanding the coverage of key child survival interventions and reducing under five mortality. And I realized that care groups built on many of the principles of the CBIO approach. And so that provided some re, uh, even stronger motivation to keep moving forward on this. And then the other thing was that uh, I saw other world-class programs emerge that were building on CBIO principles. We've talked about search this morning. I mentioned uh, earlier the Jamked project in, uh, in India, which we don't have time to go into now, but it was one of the pioneering community health worker programs in India that led to the inspiration for the largest uh, community health worker program in the world, which India has now. And the Jamked project was very influential. 
Uh, I mentioned the Hospital Albert Schweitzer, where I had the privilege of visiting uh, in 1979, and where in the year uh, 2000, I re returned there after being in Bangladesh for four years as the director of the Hospital Albert Schweitzer. Uh, I've become uh, a great admirer of BRAC's health programs, and we're going to talk about them very briefly this afternoon, which reach 100 million people. And the health extension program of Ethiopia is built on CBIO principles of visiting every home with a, a paid government-supported uh, health extension worker. And Ethiopia has been a leader in improving the health of its population in Africa. So I've mentioned the care group model very briefly, but uh, Care Americas became involved with implementing the care group approach in Guatemala, and we'll be hearing more about that this afternoon, and I've described it already, but here's another schematic uh, that uh, tries to portray the, the cascade approach of sharing messages down to every household. Um, and I mentioned also the, the wide uh, extension of the care group model throughout the world by all kinds of non-governmental organizations because it has been so successful. And the evidence for its success is very strong in, in a number of peer-reviewed publications. And so uh, Cure Americas has brought that into, as I mentioned before, CBIO Plus, and we'll hear more about that later. Um, so uh, it's the, the care group approach is a very empowering process for the women who are part of it, and there are many examples which demonstrate this, and it's been the case with our friends in Guatemala as well. We don't have we don't have to pay the volunteers who do this work, although again, as Dr. Bang said, this is a controversial issue about uh, to what degree you can rely on volunteerism and to what degree are you being unjust and discriminatory and taking advantage of volunteerism, and we can talk about that later. But the care group uh, volunteers uh, generally work only uh, three to four hours a week and so we feel like that's a, an appropriate thing to ask for volunteerism, but if you get up to eight hours or more a week, then it's appropriate to pay them. And of course, the value of uh, the care group volunteers collecting vital events verbally from the homes of illiterate people, and even care group volunteers are often illiterate, but they can pass this information verbally onto their next care group meeting, and then the, the promoter uh, who runs the care group meeting, she can record this and pass it up through the health information system. So uh, we're running out of time. We're a few minutes over, so let me uh, sort of run through this quickly. I think I'm near the end. But uh, um, So over the years, the care group process has expanded. Uh, we've started programs in Kenya. You'll be hearing about this afternoon, as well as in Guatemala, you'll be hearing about. And so all of these things are moving towards uh, a greater awareness of the value of what this is. But even so, CBIO is still relatively unknown, and many of the principles are still undeveloped. And uh, we've heard about uh, all of these things that are on the slide here uh, already, and from Abhai and uh, Ari Johnson particularly. And uh, I'm also encouraged by the fact that the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, he started his career in Ethiopia supporting and strengthening community-based uh, primary health care programs in an area and at a time when Ethiopia had no other health care services. And so he's a passionate supporter of primary health care writ large, but also community-based primary health care and community health workers and is one of the main reasons why Ethiopia was able to develop its own uh, strong program. So uh, CBIO's roots are deep and strong and it's got greater potential for the future. For the next two and a half hours or so, uh, we're going to have uh, a discussion among people who have been working with CBIO within the Cure Americas family. And we're going to start out talking about the early experience in Bolivia 
and then we're going to move to Guatemala, and then we're going to hear from our friends from Kenya. And then we're going to uh, share some recordings of people who could not be here today, but I wanted to take advantage of the physical presence of the people who were here first to begin with. And so uh, joining me first are dear friends and long-term colleagues from Bolivia. Uh, to my left is um, Dr. Ramiro Yanke, who is the country director for uh, Cure Americas Global. And he's been working with Cure Americas for 25 years now and started out in the field. Uh, working on the nuts and bolts of this work. And so we're happy to have you, Ramiro, thank you. And to his left is uh, my dear long-term friend for almost 50 years now, Nat Robison, who uh, has been <coughs> a colleague and a friend of mine for many years, but he has, uh, uh, was the founding country director of our work in Bolivia and uh, continued in that uh, role for 28 years. Uh, he's now officially retired, but like me, still very busy, and he serves on the board of our Cure Americas Global Organization. And so uh, it's great to have both of you here. Thank you for coming. And um, I'm going to ask you uh, some questions. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the time so that we will keep this within 15 minutes or so. But uh, for the first question, I'd like to ask you to describe your experience in implementing CBIO. In, uh, thank you, Henry. In 1986 and 1987, I had the privilege of implementing, the, um, implementing Cure America's first efforts to expand its public health program uh, from one or two communities to a full uh, rural mun municipality in, in Bolivia, uh, a municipality with over 10,000 people. This implied taking censuses, and, um, uh, making uh, routine home visits, uh, um, uh, developing family folders, and registering births and deaths, and uh, migrations in some 20 communities. My first question. So, Ramiro, can you describe a little bit about your initial experience in implementing CBIO? Yes, um, thank you very much, first of all. Uh, for me, it's, um, I'm really honored to be close to, to the leaders, global, many global leaders of community health. Uh, uh, sharing this conversation, uh, Dr. Henry Perry, Nathan, who's my mentor, and, and I've been uh, listening to, to the experience of Gachiroli, and I also, I was also had the opportunity to to participate and to visit Jamket with Dr. Raharo, who persons that gave me the vision, important aspects to to, to implement the CBIO. In my case, I'm already working for CSRA 25 years old uh, years, but but um, although my my responsibilities right now is to oversee, I, I had the opportunity to implement in the field um, in a very little and isolated municipality uh, in Puerto Costa, in the border with, uh, with Peru, with indigenous people, uh, with a population uh, in a town with a population of uh, 30,000 people. So, uh, Nat, what would you say were the achievements that CBIO was able to uh, uh, achieve during your time that you were closely associated with it? Uh, within a, within a, a year of having um, started the home visits and, um, and family folders um, uh, and uh, censuses and and um, vital events uh, registers, we were able, able to achieve 
close to 90% coverage on vaccinations, uh, growth monitoring, nutritional education, um, oral rehydration um, education for children under five. Um, we eventually, um, we eventually grew to serve more than 60,000 people uh, in both rural and uh, low-income urban areas of Bolivia. So Ramiro, how would you describe the achievements that you've been a part of and the role that CBIO played in achieving them? Well, besides the health coverage, I can say the other things that as achievements uh, I have seen in the community is that the um, community empowerment that um, creates and uh, generates when working side by side with the community. I have seen many women um, that have been participating, which was very difficult to see in, the, in a community, in a, for example, a community assembly, or, um, or seeing how youth people can, can participate leading um, a health community meeting. What were some of the challenges that you faced and um, some of the difficulties that uh, CBIO created in the early days? Uh, initially, we had hoped that uh, CBIO uh, would be implemented using primarily volunteer community health workers. Um, but our Ministry of Health counterparts in the project um, insisted on using paid auxiliary nurses. And so that was uh, um, a difficulty in terms of getting volunteer workers to involve, but at the same time uh, helped us to um, get rapid results in, in the CBIO because we had paid workers doing the, do, 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 doing the interventions. Um, uh, initially, we could not even get paid staff to do home visits. Um, it was just um, it was just um, strange to think that uh, the, instead of the patients coming to where the where the where the uh, uh, the health uh, worker was and going to where the family was was just a very difficult idea to to grasp. But uh, we eventually did. Um, we had to announce the staff to staff that uh, if we did not get the home visit started, we would have to fire them and um, get someone else who was willing to do it. Um, um, and another difficulty, third difficulty, what we had it was was that it was generally difficult to secure, secure the support of of, um, of health authorities. Uh, to give a small example, um, the, the health authorities um, determined um, the number of children that we had to vaccinate, determined the number of children we had to vaccinate. Andrew's working on it. Um, Andrew, you want to talk? Using uh, population projections, uh, Sent down from the sent down from the um, uh, from the capital, and uh, because of the census, uh, we knew exactly how much how many children there were and where they were, and uh, oftentimes it was uh, maybe seventy five percent or fifty percent of what had been sent to us, and they wouldn't believe that we still had one hundred percent coverage. So how about you, <coughs> Ramiro? What were some of the challenges you faced and the difficulties that the CBIO approach itself produced? Well, do you know that um, we, are an, we are an NGO that works closely with the municipal government, with the government itself, uh, municipal and national, and also with the health staff and 
and even with the municipal authorities and local authorities. So, so, and the, I'm going to share some arguments that many people, authorities, um, uh, would would raise when they talk about the census, uh, the 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 methodology, yeah. and this is this have been, this responses we have been using to face this negative argument. So the first of all is the census helps count people and create maps which can be estimated um, and get maps, for example, through Google Maps, they, they would say. So and uh, our response to this is that the CBIO is not only counting people. It's an epidemiographic methodology that help us know what was Nat was saying, to know what are the main causes of illnesses, how many people are ill, and especially who are more in risk of getting ill and to die. And to focus, based on this, our attention to the most vulnerable population. Remember that part of our discussion this morning was about money and resources. So, we are concerned about financial resources, so uh, focusing our attention and efforts are, is, is a prior, priority for us. The other thing is that home visits are invasive, high cost. So in, in, in this case, we usually face these negative arguments, saying that uh, for health, health staff, for example, is, it is an opportunity for health staff to learn about lifestyles and living conditions of, of the family. Um, and, for, and for the family, uh, doing home visits is an opportunity to express their concerns, to the opportunity to, to, to share with us um, something that is happening in, in that moment. So it's, it's an opportunity for us to know the people who, who are working with. So, and, and this is all, this creates also, uh, I am referring to home visits, create a bond of trust based on this. And gathering, about gathering by, vital events, ga gathering vital events on data about deaths and births should be done by professionals, they, sometimes they tell us. And so, uh, we, we always tell them that this can be done um, routinely um, by technical staff that can only count and, and, and see how many people are dying and which is not a very technical aspect. Okay, we've uh, pretty much run out of time here, but I'm going to ask one final question if you could answer it quickly uh, so we don't get too far behind. So, uh, Nat, what recommendations would you give others who are interested in implementing the CBIO approach? If um, you're developing a model that you plan to implement on a larger scale, from the very beginning, um, uh, make sure that you set aside resources for turning the model into public policy. And how about you, Ramiro? Well, I think, it, I was thinking this like a kind of triangle, which is very important for us. I think uh, the methodology has or needs uh, a very um, continuous induction process, not only for our health staff, uh, for our staff, but also for local authorities and uh, and other people, our key stakeholders. So, because uh, to understand exactly what's the meaning of the CVA, it's really important to not to lose the, the vision or and our mission. Since that we are working with community health workers, uh, that was another topic that this morning was raised. Uh, I think th what we are doing is to, to work with them um, with a spe specific aspects. Not to, th not to give them many responsibilities, but especially key aspects and key messages that they need to bring home. And the other thing is that sometimes um, uh, health is one of the last priorities of our communities. They, they always think 
perhaps they are thinking about uh, getting a uh, secure, sy secure system of uh, water or, or, for example, sanitation and production, or they are thinking about uh, how to get food. So linking our program to other programs is, is really important. Okay. So thank you very much. Let's give them a hand. And uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Mario Valdez to come up. The audio went out with Nat when the small example. Do you want to repeat the small difficulty example? I think we need to. Okay. All right. Mario, por favor. <laughs> So we are now going to transition into Spanish, and uh, you're going to have to suffer with my limited Spanish, but I think we can get through this, and it's a great honor and pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Mario Valdez, who is one of my global health heroes who's been facing extraordinary challenges in a very uh, difficult area of the mountains, isolated mountains of Guatemala. And uh, Mario has been working with Cure Americas for 22 years now. And he's gonna share, and he's been leading this whole experience in Guatemala, and he's gonna share very briefly uh, some of his experience. So welcome, Mario. Can Not the I kid, you have to tell them. Oh. One lot. Oh. Yeah. Uh, tengo que convertir mis palabras a castellano ahora. And that the people online have to put on themselves in the English channel to hear Mario. Those who are online, you have to put yourself into the English channel for interpretation as this next section will be all in Spanish. If you're listening online, you need to be in the English channel by selecting the globe. Unless you speak French. Unless okay. you speak French. You'll be in the French channel. Thanks. Okay, estamos listos, más o menos? Más o menos. Espero que sí. <laughs> so, Mario, uh, bienvenido. Y, uh, ¿Se puede primeramente explicar brevemente su historia profesional antes de empezar en el trabajo de la metodología? Eh, Muchas gracias eh, por habernos invitado y sabemos de que también tenemos eh, audiencia en, en muchos lados. Eh, yo voy a tratar de, de ser un poco sencillo en lo que voy a decir, porque nosotros como organización hemos tenido la suerte, creo yo, de que todo lo que hemos hecho está documentado. Ustedes lo van a poder buscar en la página de Cura Américas. E incluso el, lo último fue hace creo que dos meses, entonces seguramente conocen bastante de, nos, de, de nosotros. Ah, para poder iniciar con esto, yo quisiera que también tomáramos en cuenta algunas eh, palabras que son útiles para la parte de la metodología. Una primera es que tenemos que desaprender, <risa> tenemos que borrar un poco nuestra mente para poder conocer los otros paradigmas y eso nos va a ayudar a entender qué está pasando en el mundo y cómo podemos ayudar a las personas más necesitadas y por supuesto a salvar vidas. También eh, muchos de los que estudiamos en las escuelas médicas no tenemos un poquito de humildad, entonces es bueno que también aprendamos a ser humildes porque la humildad también nos va a permitir a entender al otro y sobre todo cómo aprendemos a trabajar en equipo porque son estas situaciones en las que nosotros hemos encontrado, encontrado como barreras muchas veces se eh, pueden haber tres cuatro o cinco instituciones tienen muchísimos recursos pero desafortunadamente poco impacto porque no a, eh, a, se aprende a trabajar en equipo y también hay muchos ministerios de salud, yo sé que hay mucha gente que también está conectada. Es bueno que los ministerios puedan aprender también a trabajar en equipo, porque eso va a ayudar bastante a, a la población. Y eh, bueno, con la pregunta que me hacía el doctor Henry, yo he tenido la dicha, como les digo, de poder trabajar ya 32 años a nivel de las comunidades y yo sé que tenemos poco tiempo y entonces voy a hacer un pequeño resumen 
de, de lo que al final eh, se une bastante a, a, a la parte de la metodología. Yo creo que con el doctor Henry siempre hemos tenido la discusión. Para nosotros sí es una metodología de base comunitaria, porque nosotros centramos todas nuestras acciones en la comunidad. Por supuesto que el censo es importante, pero se tiene que hacer a la par de, 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 de la gente, de las familias. Y en el caso nuestro, en, en Huehuetenango, hace 32 años, me tocó llegar a una comunidad muy lejana, en donde a mí me pagó la propia comunidad, las propias familias. Y entonces yo les quiero decir que esto es como a, a, a aquello que buscamos ahora, esa participación comunitaria. Al final en San Sebastián Cuatán, en Santa Eulalia, se había formado lo que se llamó el Seguro Médico Campesino, que fue a través de la Iglesia Católica, y como les digo, la comunidad ya estaba organizada, la comunidad también estaba dando, estaba pagando para que tuviera su personal de, de salud. ¿Por qué lo hacía? Porque no tenía los servicios ni del ministerio, ni tampoco uh, de servicios privados. Entonces, ellos mismos buscaron esta atención. ¿Se puede explicar un poquito más sus experiencias primeras en la implementación de la metodología? Sí, como les decía, eh, con la parte del seguro, eh, fue coincidente, yo creo que el doctor Henry trabajaba esto en Bolivia y nosotros también en el año 92, 93 y 94 estábamos desarrollando este tipo de trabajo. Nosotros, eh, pues, estas comunidades no tenían caminos, luz, teléfono, ni agua entubada y todos eran, eh, ¿cómo se llama?, asegurados por, por, por este programa sin embargo, a muchas familias la clínica le quedaba a ocho o, o seis horas, entonces era imposible poder, eh, digamos, asistir a, a la clínica. Entonces nosotros decidimos visitar comunidad por comunidad y esto nos, nos ayudó a conocerlos y fue con ellos que empezamos a, a empezar a hacer los croquis comunitarios y sus censos y los listados para que la misma comunidad se diera cuenta eh, qué, qué estaba pasando con su vida y, sa y su salud. Yo no tenía otras enfermeras o, 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 o gente de apoyo, fue la misma comunidad quien hizo sus croquis, quien hizo sus listados, quien hizo sus prioridades. Gracias. ¿Cuáles fueron algunos de los, más, los logros más importantes que ustedes han uh, logrado? Bueno, este sistema de, de trabajo en conjunto y trabajo en equipo con mucha participación comunitaria generalmente tiene impactos, tiene impactos rápidos porque todos nos vemos como una familia y todos nos apoyamos. Entonces eso hace que cualquier niño que esté enfermo tenga la confianza a dónde ir, cualquier señora que tenga una emergencia no se siente sola, tiene el apoyo de su familia y de la comunidad. Los impactos son, son grandes y como les digo, ahí tenemos los estudios. Nosotros tenemos la dicha de que están los estudios ahí en la página web. Eh, como Mario dijo, uh, tenemos una publicación de 10 artículos que salieron en uh, febrero de este año que describe los logros de la, la, de la metodología en, en Guatemala. Uh, Mario, ¿cuáles fueron algunos de los uh, desafíos que ustedes han encontrado y las otras dificultades de esta metodología? Bueno, <risa> desafíos sí son muchos, muchos. Lo importante es no tener el miedo. Eso es lo más importante. Y sobre todo también tener un equipo que le ayude a uno para enfrentar esos desafíos. Entonces yo animo a nivel mundial a que no tengamos miedo y que Cualquier tipo de desafío tiene su solución. Miren, ahora que me hace la pregunta el doctor Henry Perry, la paradoja del Sapiens, ¿verdad? ¿Cuánto hemos avanzado? Pero también, ¿cuánta gente vive en edad de piedra? Gracias, Mario. Uh, ¿Cuáles uh, serían sus recomendaciones para otra gente en otras partes del mundo si ellos tienen interés de implementar esta metodología, ¿qué aviso, qué, qué recomendaciones podría dar los 
bueno, si desaprendemos, si somos humildes, si en un momento trabajamos en equipo, seguramente que esto se puede implementar en cualquier área, sea urbana, sea rural, sea con dinero, sin dinero, se va a poder implementar. Los, des los desafíos post pandemia, yo creo que la misma metodología puede también abarcarlos y apoyarse. Uh, nosotros también estamos, yo creo que esto es en muchas partes uh, del mundo también, es muy importante el empoderamiento de la mujer, porque la mujer tiene estos desafíos de también apoyarnos a tener una sociedad más justa y más equitativa. Okay. Gracias, Mario, gracias. Nos vamos a un aplauso. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mario. So we're going to invite our uh, Kenyan colleagues to come up. Uh, so if you would please come up, Anne Carubo and Kevin Cayando, and we'll talk about our uh, more recent work in, uh, in Kenya. So before we get started with the questions, uh, just briefly introduce yourselves and tell us who you are and, and what you do and a little bit about your background. Then we're going to make the Zoom announcement again for the interpretation. Oh yeah. The interpretation now is back to English, so if you're an English speaker, you can get out of the English channel and get into the main channel again. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello all, uh, my name is uh, Kevin. Kayando Aula uh, from Kisi County, Kenya. Uh, I have uh, 10 years uh, experience in public health with different organizations and five years working with Cure Americas. Hello, I'm Anke Rubo from Kenya, Kiko uh, Project, and uh, I've worked for the project for now five years since 2018. Okay. Very good. So uh, tell us a little bit about your experience in implementing CBIO. Uh, my experience implementing CBIO uh, was mainly shaped by my trip to Guatemala when I went to learn firsthand from Dr. Mario. Uh, uh, and I was able, it, it shaped my thinking about CBIO because my perception about CBIO was that CBIO was uh, the community strategy approach that is commonly implemented in Africa after the launch of the Bomaco Initiative. But after going to the ground, I saw things different and it shaped my perception. As uh, Mario said, you have to unlearn and learn new paradigms for you to implement and make changes in the world. My experience about CBIO is, uh, I can say it's very good, and at first it felt like a lot of work, but we could see the fruits. Because now with the how door-to-door -door movement, yeah, we were able to capture what we really, the data that we really wanted. And even after the census, any vital events can be referred by the community. It became a community work, not just a kick-off work, because now they could refer they could report new vital events. Anybody coming into the community was reported to us because now we had involved the community, the entire community, and we could hear them saying, we've not seen a CBO that comes door to door. So it was a plus to us, a very good experience, and a very good way of uh, getting data. We got our own data, and this data was used as a basis of our implementation. So what would you all say have been some of the achievements of your work over the last five years? To me, uh, having a robust data collection system that is verifiable was one of the key cornerstones of implementing CBIO. We were able to uh, evidently prove our data to various stakeholders, both at low level, at the community level, and high level at the Ministry of Health. And so that was so much um, important to us because we were able to report uh, 
modalities, for example, in the in, at baseline when you were implementing, and as I was watching the video by Abe here, I saw kickoff firsthand. I saw everything that happened in Kisi. It's just that uh, the numbers were different, but the steep downfall of mortalities, of infant mortalities and maternal mortalities were similar. For example, in year one at baseline, we had 60 infant deaths. And then this reduced to 18 over three years. And now we normally have just few peri perinatal mortalities caused by delays in facility. And then uh, uh, for maternal mortality, we had 10 maternal deaths at baseline. And this dropped uh, steeply to one after year three and zero after, after three years. I think that was just what Abe showed, and it showed me kick up first hand. Okay, so uh, one of the greatest achievements of kick up is the building trust in the community. Sometimes the community is very delicate, and you can do things thinking they are right, then you later realize they didn't like it. But now we build trust by engaging community leaders, the gatekeepers, we ask for permission when we want to do any activities, we engage them in, in community dialogues. We have meetings that we can talk with the community. We share our feedback, we share our feedback, our challenges, and we are able to talk on ways we can deal with the challenges together. And so they feel involved, they feel loved, and they really support us in the community. The other achievement is the care group approach. With the care group approach, we've been able to involve the men, which was not easy. Men didn't know they're supposed to be involved in anything maternal. And now with the care group approach, anytime the care group volunteers go for return home visits, they will ask if the man is around. And men are now really involved. They participate in our activities, the home visit activities. They support the women in going to the clinic. They remind them of the, of the days. They escort them. And if uh, the mother gives birth, they can be able to do the household cares as the mother, uh, the mother takes care of the baby. And also, uh, the care group approach has been a, a more of self-driven. Women learn from themselves, even if people we are there or not, they can just uh, train the rest and give a report. Yeah, so this has been a very good experience of the CDIO approach. So, uh, can you share with us uh, what some of the difficulties and challenges have been that you faced, particularly as a result of using the CBIO approach? One of the main challenges at baseline was skepticism from the data absorbers, like, like the Ministry of Health. They couldn't believe that people were dying in their communities, that the maternal mortality the, 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 the neonatal mortality rates in, in their records is 20 per 100,000 live births, per 1,000 per live births. But then the kick-up uh, mortality rate in that catchment brings 60 per 1,000 live births, three times. So we were at difficulty proving it. But then we had the census impact-oriented approach door-to-door. -door. When we are contact, in conducting verbal autopsies, we were able to co-opt the Ministry of Health staff to go door to door to be able to, for them to, to witness firsthand that these mortalities are happening. That's the power of CBIO, verifiable data. Another challenge that we were, we were, we were, we were, we were facing under CBIO is high volume data. CBIO door to door aspect has high volume data and at inception we were, using, we were collecting data manually. But thanks to Cure Americas, very soon we are piloting a digital and rolling out a digital data collection platform that is going to uh, uh, mitigate that challenge. So another um, big challenge is uh, the in and out migration. Yeah, and uh, most of them out migration. We have, we'll have pregnancy, have the baby eating maybe three months, then the mother will migrate. Or we'll have the mother till 18 months, then the mother will migrate with the baby. So this has been an issue, and uh, when we were looking to Henry, he, advises us, he advised us to capture new people after six months. Maybe we will know the mother now is permanently staying in that area. 
but it has been a big challenge. And so anytime we don't capture in migration that we maybe think might migrate, it's also a problem. Because now the community complains, why are you not capturing this? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, what advice would you give other people or other organizations if they're thinking about implementing this? Uh, how could you help them orient themselves to get started on the right foot? Building trust with communities is the most important thing before you start implementing CDIO. And when you are doing census data collection, you are likely not to be census-based if you do it yourself. You have to use and adopt the systems of the local, do mapping locally, not your digital maps, because there are very many corners in communities that you may not know. You have to use community guides to guide you door to door, and do not do it yourself. Another aspect that I would recommend is CBIO work is great but it's not greatly published. So more needs to be done to be public so that it can be adopted by many governments like it has it happened in India. Yeah, my recommendation is we need to involve the government every step from day one of this implementation. The reason why we need to, to involve the government is we might not be there forever and they really need to continue with this because like now we've worked for, Quatamanda has worked for over 20 years, we've worked for over for five years now. Imagine after five years and there's no these interventions in the community. We've really invested a lot and that's why I recommend government involvement to take up this course when maybe we leave and also to replicate in other counties. Because for us there's a call that we need to scale to the entire case. But because of funds we are not able. But if the government is involved, it can take it to the other counties, yeah. Thank you. I've been inspired by the excitement that Kevin and Ann have about their work and their enthusiasm for CBIO. And let me just ask you very briefly if you could share a little bit about all the people who are coming from other places to see what you're doing. I think this is extraordinary and very exciting too. Yeah, we've had volunteer trips to Kenya from a lot of universities in the U.S., from the UNC Chapel Hill University, from the UCLA University, from the from the Cure Americas Global, uh, from the Guatemalan team, just to witness firsthand what we have been done. So what we want to say, everyone is welcome. Sharing is caring, we're able to share our knowledge, you're able to see fast and seeing is believing. You are welcome to Kenya. Yeah, and this year we've had uh, volunteers from Kenya, very new volunteers who started last uh, to a month ago, and they're also having a good experience. Last year we had uh, volunteers from University of uh, Kisi who did our census together with us. They also had a good learning experience, and they wish to, to work with us in the future. It's only that we don't have funds, but in the future, such people will be considered. Okay, well, let's give them a hand, and we're going to move on to the next thing. So thank you very much. Uh, we're going to show a couple of videos now, so give me a minute to get them set up, please. So we do have a question in the chat. Uh, one is for um, our partners from Guatemala or Kenya or Bolivia to talk about uh, what are some of the data collection tools that you used and what are some barriers that you faced when training people on CBIO? So do any of our partners want to come forward and answer that question? What are your data collection tools? and what are some of the barriers in training on the methodology? Well, uh, the methodology has different kind of um, tools, but I can say that the main 
of them is the family folder. And the family folder is a um, collection of different kind, and, and I have seen different um, forms uh, in different experiences in, in Guatemala, Bolivia, and other, uh, and other experiences. But, but, uh, but I think the main is uh, a form that collects information about the health situation of the mother, the child, and um, um, in some experiences I have seen to, in, to include the, into the family folder um, a copy of the, um, of the child card that has information about the, the health information, about growth monitoring, vaccination, and also the form related to mother health if the mother is, for example, pregnant, and, um, and some other information. But, but also um, another element or aspect, that, a form that has our tool is the um, vital events information, which uh, includes information about the number of uh, um, somebody that, that died or was born in, in the family. Um, I think it, this is w one of the main important things. Uh, and on the other hand, we have, as Kevin was saying, different other kind of information related to, to gather them, to, to, um, to include the health information, indicators, and some other things. Can I add something? Yeah. Let me just add one more little thing to that. And what, what's important about the family health folder is that it's, it has a number on it that corresponds to the number of the household, and so it's stored in the health post or the health facility. And uh, when the health worker goes out into the community, the information is right there available and readily accessible in an orderly kind of form rather than listing all the family folders by alphabetical or some other system that's linked to the census uh, and the household maps. Yeah, um, yes, and uh, the folders are classified in, in with different, uh, different levels of risk. Um, and the other thing that we, we have is the map. The map um, that describes where is the people, that describes the, the number of families we have in a certain area. So, and I, ho I have also seen this um, in, with different characteristics in every project. Uh, in some projects they use uh, the, the physical map and in some others they are already using uh, electronic maps, virtual maps. So uh, from our partners, anybody else like to comment on data collection tools or barriers to training in CBIO? Well, just one other quick comment, and that is uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about some of the technical parts of uh, CBIO, and we'll get into some of this, although it's limited what we can do. Well, thank you for those very good questions. We'll transition to the videos now. Speak? Yeah. The next video, we apologize for the time, uh, time lapse here, but we're having trouble having to shift things from one computer to another because of technical issues related to using the room and so forth and so on. But uh, the next uh, presentation is going to be a discussion with Dardo and Meet Machavez, who are Bolivians who uh, started a CBIO program down in the tropics, as I mentioned earlier today. And so we'll hear from them. Uh, and uh, Ara Stalik, who is one of our long-term staff members here, will be in the video as well, as you'll see. Welcome, everybody. This is Henry Perry again. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you to my 
dear long friends for more than 30 years now, uh, Dardo and Mitma Chavez, a husband and wife uh, team. Dardo is a physician, Mitma is a nurse, and they have been working in Montero, Bolivia uh, for four decades now in community health and are legendary figures in Bolivia because of their uh, great success in implementing CBIO. And it's wonderful to have Dardo and Mitma with us. I'm also very pleased that Ira Stalik is with us again to lead the Spanish. Ira is a longtime member of the staff of Pure Americas and has uh, provided leadership for CBIO implementation in Guatemala and Liberia and in Kenya. So, Ira, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you carry on in Spanish and uh, mm -hmm. leave the questioning and uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Okay. Gracias, Henry. Uh, otra vez, mil gracias, Dardo y Mitma, por estar aquí y uh, para, por hablar con nosotros. Uh, como ya se sabe, hay cuatro preguntas muy básicas. Lastimamente, no tenemos mucho tiempo para cada pregunta, más o menos cinco o seis minutos. Uh, en, entonces, uh, vamos a proceder y... Uh, uh, concentrarnos en los, en los puntos más claves, los puntos más importantes. Y la primera pregunta es, describa su experiencia en la implementación de CBIO, en español, MBCOI, especialmente en su papel de pioneros de esta metodología en, en Bolivia. Muchas gracias. Primero quiero agradecer la oportunidad que tenemos yo y mi esposa Mitma para poder hacer esta clase de, eh, contar esta clase de experiencia que hemos tenido acá en Bolivia, en Sudamérica. Y agradecerle especialmente a nuestro maestro, el doctor Henry Perry, quien fue el precursor para la introducción de esta metodología. Tenemos que pasar prácticamente un año conociendo las costumbres, hábitos que no eran de nuestro conocimiento y, nuestra, y nuestro diario vivir. Por eso cuando a, aprendimos la metodología con base sensal fue una tarea bien difícil porque debíamos sortear muchos obstáculos hasta lograr conocer más de las prácticas, costumbres, religión de esta población o de estos migrantes con los que debíamos empezar a trabajar. En realidad la metodología con base sensal empezó tres, casi cuatro años después de que, de que nosotros empezamos a desarrollar nuestro trabajo con el Consejo. En realidad en el año 1992 y también con la llegada de, del doctor Perry con mayor frecuencia porque él vino anteriormente con, para conocer nuestro trabajo que hacíamos y en el año 1992 ya eh, nosotros teníamos más experiencia y vino el doctor Perry y nos enseñó cómo debíamos desarrollar la metodología. La metodología con base sensal orientada al impacto nos enseñó que debemos empezar por lo más pequeño, o sea, no empezar en una población demasiado grande, sino con familias pequeñas, con pocas familias mejor, en un área pequeña y determinada. Iniciamos nuestro trabajo, nuestro proceso de aprendizaje y de conocimiento en un área, un grupo reducido de gente. Esta metodología nos enseña también, cuando aprendimos la metodología, que debemos de ser muy prudentes en el proceso de aprendizaje y enseñanza para no empujar a la familia, porque algunas familias este, se sentían 
más bien empujadas por nosotros, pero la a las familias hay que aprender a enseñarles poco a poco. Por lo que, tra por lo que trabajamos y, y fuerte con ellos y nosotros debemos aprender paso a paso observando las dificultades y los éxitos que vamos encontrando, porque a veces es muy problemático cuando nosotros entramos de plano y queremos hacer cosas para ellos sin tomar en cuenta sus costumbres, su forma de ser, su idioma. Eso es lo que en esta etapa nosotros pudimos hacerlo, misma Sí, una, una experiencia para compartir en los inicios de la implementación de la metodología con base censal orientada al impacto, fue que empezamos por un manzano, pero eh, la totalidad de personal habíamos dividido en dos grupos. Un grupo iba a un manzano y otro grupo iba a otro manzano para ir conociendo el comportamiento, la cultura de las familias y también para ir adquiriendo destrezas en el manejo de los procesos y procedimientos de la metodología. Aquí estamos hablando del manejo de los instrumentos, la formulación de preguntas a las familias, el llenado de los instrumentos, al final una evaluación Uh, viendo los datos estadísticos de qué es lo que había pasado en el trabajo en este manzano. Recuerdo bien y me marcó a mí para toda mi vida ese aprendizaje. Habían pasado seis meses de hacer la visita en un manzano que a mí me tocó y que era de 33 familias. Y cuando hicimos la evaluación midiendo los indicadores versus las metas, habíamos conseguido que el 20% de niños estaban vacunados después de seis meses de visita. Entonces, cuando analizamos, dijimos, ¿qué pasó si seis meses hemos visitado a las familias? Entonces, surgió los factores que las familias no están en la casa, Salen a las 5 de la mañana a trabajar y llegan a las 10 de la noche. Y solamente se las pueden encontrar algunas familias los domingos. Esto fue un aprendizaje grande, conocimiento. Entonces, la mentalidad del personal era, yo trabajo de lunes a viernes y trabajo desde las 8 hasta las 6 de la tarde y bueno, como, no hay, como las familias no están en los horarios que trabajo, pues entonces no se vacuna, no se da orientación, ¿no? Entonces esto nos ayudó a indicar que la metodología nos dice que no está en función de horarios de trabajo, sino en función de qué hacemos para mejorar estos indicadores, ¿no? Para que la salud de los niños, las mujeres... Este, ahí cambiamos y dijimos entonces ¿qué vamos a hacer? ¿vamos a ir los domingos para buscar las familias? ¿o vamos a ir a sus fuentes de trabajo? entonces esto a mí este aprendizaje hasta el día de hoy me marcó y esto es, eh, es la enseñanza que yo llevo a los profesionales jóvenes que no hay sábado ni domingo para prevenir la muerte de las personas y tenemos que organizarnos y disponer de ese bien. ¿Qué recomendaciones ustedes darían a otros interesados u otros practicantes en esta metodología de base sin sábado? Yo creo que el, el hecho de que nosotros tenemos niveles de experiencias en diferentes lugares ha hecho de que nosotros podamos darnos cuenta de que es importante 
decirle, digamos, a las otras instituciones que están trabajando que la primera cosa que debemos hacer es entablar una relación con la comunidad, una relación con las autoridades y también una relación entre nosotros, los trabajadores. Los trabajadores que, por ejemplo, en el caso nuestro, necesariamente, como estamos, yo estoy contando mi, nuestra experiencia, vivimos en una población más o menos de unos 140 mil habitantes y tenemos una parte de esos, unos 30 mil, 35 mil habitantes, bajo nuestra responsabilidad. Y hay otras instituciones que trabajan, que son del gobierno, de la alcaldía, que también encargados de un área de trabajo vienen acá para pedirnos o para que nosotros les podamos entrenar personal para que puedan desarrollar ciertas actividades en la zona donde están trabajando eso para nosotros es un orgullo es algo muy bonito pero el problema es que ya ha entrado la parte política la parte política dice solamente van a trabajar cinco meses, van a trabajar un año, vamos a cambiar al personal, porque así dice nuestro partido político que está a cargo de, de, de las actividades de salud. Eso es lo que está pasando ahora acá. Entonces, lo que nosotros hacemos es entrenar la gente que está trabajando en los otros servicios. Ese es un orgullo. Nuestra metodología ya es conocida, es respetada y es aplaudida por toda la gente de la comunidad. Eso nos deja una sensación de haber tenido éxito, porque ya nosotros ya estamos en una etapa ya regresiva, ya no podemos ir mucho más allá, si no tenemos la satisfacción, así como tiene el doctor Perry, el doctor Wyon, el, el doctor Jones, el Nathan, están orgullosos de las actividades que estamos nosotros desarrollando, que hemos desarrollado y eso para nosotros es muy importante. Muchas gracias. También es, es muy importante contar con personal capacitado, estable, y en, y en un número suficiente para cubrir toda la población de un área determinada. Si se quiere tener resultados o, o positivos. Ok, mil gracias. Uh, como ya dije, lastimadamente no tenemos más tiempo. Podemos hablar en este tema mucho, mucho tiempo. Y uh, muchas gracias por uh, su participación. Gracias. Ahora, gracias. Eh, muchas gracias. Uh, muchas gracias, uh, gracias. Dardo. Eh, yo quisiera mencionar que los logros de trabajo de ellos en Montero son algunos de los mejores en el mundo porque... Uh, su tasa de mortalidad en niños es mejor que existe en los Estados Unidos. Y también ellos no casi tienen una muerte materna, entonces ellos tienen un sistema de registros de eventos vitales que es una cosa maravillosa. Entonces quisiera notar los éxitos en el trabajo que es resultó de muchos años de colaboración comunitaria. Entonces, uh, muy, te, muy, uh, muy quisiera decir un aplauso a ustedes. So, thank you so much, Dardo and Mitma. You have been an inspiration to thousands of your fellow colleagues and uh, citizens of Montero, but you've been a model for Montero and beyond. And, We're so grateful for all that you have done to help your people and to promote uh, the uh, development of uh, community-oriented public health, working with communities to help them improve their health. So thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to more discussions. Thank you.
Gracias. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Uh, the person being interviewed today is Dr. Franz Trujillo, who was a member of our staff at Cure Americas for quite a long time and then left to assume a very high position in the Ministry of Health in Bolivia and has recently returned now to uh, begin a new activity of the Consejo de Salud Rural Andino in El Alto, Bolivia, which is on the outskirts of the capital, La Paz. Interviewing him today is my dear friend, Ira Stalik, who is also a longtime uh, staff member at Pure Americas, now officially retired, and he lives in Columbia, South America. And so I'm gonna let Ira do the interviewing of Franz, given that uh, his English capacity far exceeds mine, and I thought it would be a better uh, quality interview if we let Ira lead this instead of me. So thank you very much, and Ira, go ahead. Okay, thanks for the compliment, Henry, but it's my Spanish capacity. <laughs> um, okay, gracias otra vez, Franz, por estar. Y, um, la entrevista es uh, bastante uh, corta, 20, 25 minutos. Hay cuatro preguntas, entonces vamos a llevar como cinco, seis o ocho minutos uh, por uh, pregunta. Y normalmente voy a dejarle hablar. Y uh, probablemente voy a no decir nada hasta uh, tal que haya algo que no es uh, claro. O oh, si uh, falta tiempo y debemos um, progresar a, a la próxima pregunta. Ok, comenzamos. Uh, Y la primera pregunta es, en general, uh, describa su experiencia en la implementación de CBIO, es el español, MBCOI, especialmente um, como pioner, uno de los, los pioneros, de los, los primeros practicantes de esta metodología. Buenos días por haberme invitado para compartir eh, las experiencias en relación a la metodología de, de la base sensal. Bueno, primero quiero decir que antes habíamos trabajado con eh, un médico tradicional eh, muy conocido aquí en Bolivia, el doctor Jimmy Salles. Así, él era un médico tradicional, investigador, además de eso. Entonces, yo tenía una experiencia en relación a la al trabajo de coordinación, diremos, entre la medicina tradicional y la medicina convencional. Ahora es bien importante que a partir de esa experiencia tengo eh, la oportunidad de trabajar con el CSRA en, el, en la región altiplánica, concretamente en el municipio de Ancoraemes. Es ahí donde... Primero, mi experiencia era eh, un, una relación en el trabajo de la medicina tradicional, pero ahí ellos ya habían eh, avanzado en la implementación de esta metodología. Es decir, eh, la, a través de dos instrumentos muy importantes, que es la carpeta familiar y es la estrategia de la visita domiciliaria, ¿no? que en un principio tal vez yo no lo entendía, pero al final... Eh, es decir, pude ver las cualidades y eh, principalmente lo importante que era para mí eh, eh, realizar ese trabajo, porque implicaba eh, principalmente el trabajo de conocer el territorio, conocer a la comunidad y conocer a la familia. Son aspectos muy importantes. Y el, eh, el, el otro tema era que uno, para poder realizar ese trabajo, eh, tiene que incorporarse, involucrarse, vivir en la comunidad, ser parte de la comunidad. Eh, yo personalmente lo veo como un requisito muy importante porque el trabajo de hacer una carpetización, el trabajo de hacer una visita domiciliaria, uno de los requisitos muy importantes es la confianza de la gente, la confianza de la familia hacia el personal de salud. Porque si no existe esa confianza, no funciona el tema del, de la metodología de la base sensal, ¿no? 
Entonces, eh, nosotros empezamos este trabajo en las comunidades que tenía este municipio. También había otro, eh, otros colegas, compañeros, trabajando en el municipio de Carabuco, en el municipio de Escoma y también en el municipio de Puerto Acosta, que son municipios colindantes. Entonces, todo este trabajo lo estructuramos de manera muy coordinada y también lo hacíamos el seguimiento y la evaluación a través de una, eh, es decir, de reuniones de evaluación y de avance de, de, de todo el trabajo. Nosotros, como médicos, eh, pensábamos que solamente el auxiliar de enfermería, en ese entonces solamente habían auxiliares de enfermería en las comunidades, ¿sí? podían desarrollar este trabajo. Pero personalmente yo he visto que era muy importante el, eh, es decir, el acompañamiento y el trabajo conjunto con todos los auxiliares de enfermería. En cada comunidad había un eh, auxiliar de enfermería que estaba a cargo de todas las familias de esa comunidad y cada eh, enfermero tenía las, la carpetización completa y se actualizaba permanentemente y también se hacía una actualización eh, en cada gestión anual. Eh, esto es importante eh, anotarlo porque eh, la actualización de la carpetización no necesita realizar una actividad como el censo concretamente en, en una nueva visita, sino es, esto es un trabajo permanente. Eso es lo que yo personalmente lo valoro, he aprendido mucho en ese trabajo de que nosotros podamos ver eh, ¿qué, qué familias existen en las comunidades eh, le doy un ejemplo el te eh, a través de una invitación eh, que también diremos uh, eh, comparto en el tema de, de la implementación de una determinada de un determinado modelo de salud que es importante para, para el país eh, el, he sido eh, parte de un equipo que eh, ha formado, es decir, eh, médicos con una nueva eh, visión del tema de salud integral principalmente. Entonces, eh, a eso se le ha llamado aquí en, en, en el Ministerio de Salud como salud familiar, eh, que está involucrada con la familia comunitaria, que es parte de una comunidad, eh, es intercultural porque estamos hablando de la revalorización eh, de la complementariedad con los con conocimientos eh, de salud de nuestros ancestros. Entonces, salud familiar, comunitaria e intercultural no eh, se basa en, en esa, eh, es decir, en esa filosofía para poder primero formar eh, eh, médicos mm, con una visión más integral del tema de la salud, poder eh, a partir de ahí eh, cambiar un modelo totalmente asistencialista en un modelo más integral de, del trabajo en, en salud. Y también he eh, sido parte también de la... Eh, a partir de eso... Eh, y, y, y este trabajo de... de, de el, de la metodología de base censal es una vertiente del, eh, diremos, del, de un programa grande que se hizo, que se llama el programa de Mi Salud, ¿no? Donde los médicos eh, han sido formados con esta visión, donde ellos han podido tener la oportunidad de poder eh, implementar el tema de la visita familiar, de la carpetización, pero con un trabajo dentro de un modelo mucho más humano, más integral y más revolucionario, diríamos, ¿no? Entonces, eso se ha hecho a nivel de, de todo el país, se ha hecho. Es un trabajo eh, en más de 308 municipios que se ha desarrollado esto, en los nueve departamentos del, del país. Entonces, eso todavía continúa eh, ese trabajo. Bueno, gracias, Franz, y felicitaciones con todos sus 
contribuciones a la salud de su país. Muchas gracias, doctor. Gracias por estos momentos son muy importantes. Eh, tal vez he tenido la oportunidad de poder compartir todas estas experiencias. Gracias por darme estos momentos. Gracias, doctor, al amigo. Gracias, Fran. Pues, con amigo mucho gusto. Y gracias, Ara, amigo con mío. Gusto. Tengo buen día. Buen día, gracias. Hi, everybody. This is Henry Perry again, and it's my great pleasure to introduce you to one of my global health heroes, uh, Ira Stolick, who is a longtime veteran of our work with Cure Americas and one of the great champions of the CBIO approach. And uh, I'm so delighted that Ira has agreed to talk with us today because he, I think more than anybody I know, Uh, has a really deep understanding of what CBIO is and the power that it brings to uh, public health programming. So, our welcome. And Thank you. Why don't you start out by sharing a little bit about your history with Cure America, and then we'll get into the specific questions after that. Okay. Well, um, I had a, a midlife uh, radical career change. I was a college English professor, and then I decided to um, go into the Peace Corps, and I was offered a uh, public health work in Central America, in Belize and, and Guatemala, and I I took it, and, um, and then, like they say, the rest is history. I got hooked on this kind of work, and, um, and so afterwards, at the ripe old age of 50, God, how old was I, 55 or 70? I went back to grad school and got my master's in public health, University of Washington, I'm from Washington, um, and uh, got my best. And then I started looking for work, and um, and uh, fortunately, I had the uh, the good fortune to um, end up with Cure Americas starting in 2008, and uh, and so I worked for Cure Americas. Um, as both an employee and as an independent contractor, kind of back and forth from 2008 until my retirement, just this past uh, December. Uh, so that's eight, uh, 15 years altogether. Um, and uh, what I was first checking out here in America is that they were, of course, checking out me. I had the, the good fortune to meet Henry. Um, uh, we met at a Vietnamese restaurant in uh, Richmond, <laughs> Virginia. I was in North Carolina interviewing and Henry was up in West Virginia looking for, um, uh, I forgot who you were working for, um, Henry up there. Uh, future generations. Future generations, right. And that was kind of a halfway point. And so um, so Henry pointed me toward a lot of good sources of material about CBIO, which I proceeded to devour. And I became hooked. It just seemed so logical to me, especially right at, right out of grad school, right out of my um, epidemiology 101 class. And I'm saying, hey, this is epidemiology. This is just basic epidemiology, but with a community basis, okay, um, rooted in the communities that it's uh, serving. So uh, I thought, yeah, this makes total sense to me. I was enthusiastic about it right from the start. And so um, uh, we started uh, planning a um, a project based, you know, utilizing CBIO for uh, in Liberia. Up to that point, we, Cure Americas had only been in Latin America, in Bolivia, um, Guatemala, Haiti, and, and Mexico. And so we wanted to become Cure Americas Global. And so this is a chance to get a project going in, in, in Africa, in Liberia, um, which was in huge need. It was the country had just been horribly devastated by a long civil war. Most of the health infrastructure was gone. And we uh, were fortunate enough to uh, find a really good partner, the Ganta Hospital. And uh, in Ganta, north central um, Liberia, near the border with Guinea. And uh, 
USAID uh, was gracious enough to grant us a million and a half dollars in Child Survival Health Grant Program to implement uh, a CBIO based project there. And so, uh, so that was my first, but my first experience really with CBI on the ground, and I'm going to hit the rewind button here a little. Um, well, actually, no, going forward, because <laughs> I do CBIO in theory from the various readings Henry had pointed me to, um, but I never see, actually seen it in action. And so um, that summer, I believe it was in July, I uh, flew down to Bolivia and I sat at the feet of the masters, <laughs> Dardo, Chavez, and uh, Robeson. And I spent three weeks down there, uh, first in the Montero area, uh, where Dardo gave me um, my CBIO 101 crash course. And, uh, and then up to um, the Altiplano, La Paz, and El Alto, where I got a chance to uh, work with Nat. And in both places, I spent a lot of time in the field um, shadowing their staff, especially their, uh, what they call the vigilantes, the uh, community health volunteer uh, workers who go house to house doing that essential part of CEO called routine home visitation. And um, so that gave me a really good hands-on concrete understanding of how this actually works. And so um, with that in hand, on top of, you know, building on my good theoretical knowledge, um, I then went to Liberia um, for the second time. First time was in January 2008 to plan the project and started training the, the staff of uh, Ganta Hospital, the staff who uh, about 25 or so, maybe 30 staff people who were going to be implementing the project. They included nurses. Uh, HIV counselors, uh, vaccinators, um, uh, the water sanitation technicians, um, you know, the whole range of, of, of services, and also the community health workers, uh, they call them the, uh, the GCHWs. Oh, the and, um, and so, uh, it was a uh, really joyous work and I was just delighted with how hungry they were to learn this stuff. And, um, uh, cause they really wanted to rebuild their country. And, um, one, a little anecdote I love to tell, and it really, um, mean, I think it says a lot, um, is that about halfway through the training, one of the, uh, vaccinators, Kose, he stood up and uh, uh, these are Mono people, the Mono uh, tribe culture and, and they, uh, their culture, they, they love oratory. They're very dramatic. And, they, um, and he gave a little um, talk, but he began his talk saying, why have they been keeping this from us all these years? Why, or why have they been hiding this from us all these years? And I asked him, what do you mean? Well, they had all been working for, um, for uh, other NGOs, you know, who are doing, trying to do good work there in, in Liberia, some of them for as long as 10 years or so. Um, and they had never learned the big picture. All they were ever trained to do was, if they were vaccinated, how to give the right, you know, measles vaccination to the right age child. If they were um, a maternal nurse, you know, the specific skills for, say, delivering a baby or doing antenatal care. But nobody gave them the big picture of understanding what are the causes of disease and, and disability. Um, what are the, how can they be? What are their ways of, of, of being prevented or treated? Um, how can we identify the most readily preventable and treatable causes of death and disability? And um, and then how can we identify the barriers that are preventing us from, from implementing those and eliminate those barriers? Um, and this was like an expansion of consciousness for them. If you forgive my 1960s phrasing of this, they just, it just blew their minds and they just ate it up. And, you know, and so that it's one thing for me, this, you know, intellectual hyper-educated, um, 
you know, white person from the U.S. to get enthusiastic about this. But for these people on the ground there, trying to rebuild their uh, devastated country to really get it and, and, and grasp this and see the practicality and usefulness of this um, was, was really encouraging. And during the training, you know, we did a lot of hands-on stuff during the training. Like, for example, I had one of the key aspects of CBIO is you do a census of every community and you create a community map. And, and, and through that, you know exactly where everybody is especially those who are most vulnerable, you know, pregnant women, the under two children, um, and, you know, exactly had a zero in on them. And, uh, and so we were out in the rain, <laughs> not practicing, the, doing these censuses, and, um, and then we had a chance to put it into action. We had, you know, we had a census for a particular village, and then um, the hospital got this shipment of long-lasting, um, insecticide treated mosquito nets to prevent malaria. And, and so it, they needed to be distributed. And that's uh, a glitch due to my editing this. We had a longer version of this and I had to shorten it. I didn't realize it was going to cut off like that. So apologize for that. It's my great pleasure now to uh, chat with Barbara Mufaletto to my left and Andrew Herrera to her left. Barbara is the program manager for Cure Americas Global, based in Raleigh, and has been in this position for almost 10 years now. And Andrew Herrera, our executive director, has been in his position for 10 years. And they've been uh, interacting with CBIO uh, in a lot of different ways, and so we want to have a chance to hear from them directly. So, uh, Barbara, can you share a little bit about your experience with the CBIO approach? Sure, thank you, Henry, and good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing, like having many, uh, sorry, learning about CBIO in various like stages of development. So um, I first heard about CBIO when I began working at Care Americas around 10 years ago, and I learned about it from hearing about the Bolivia Project, from reading about their methods, their accomplishments, and get an idea for, you know, from theory to practice, how CBIO is implemented in another country. Um, I was then able to learn about CBIO through visiting our partner, Care Americas Guatemala, and seeing that work firsthand. So, um, again, moving up kind of that the level of knowledge from theory to uh, hearing about implementation to seeing it in action. And, um, and I tell you, every time I moved up a level, I, I just became more excited about it. Um, next, I was able to work very closely with Iris Stolek and our partners in Kenya, who you've heard from today, to um, begin a new project in Kisi County that uses the CBIO methodology. And um, I've had the pleasure of seeing that project develop for five years now. And so um, through this process, I've seen the development of CBO from, I guess, like ground zero to being a fully successful project, and now I have the pleasure of working with our partner um, at HOM Ministries, his name is Anais Frankel, and I believe he is on this call as well, um, and uh, we are working together in near Port-au-Prince, Haiti, to begin a CBIO project in partnership with Haiti Outreach Ministries. So. Thank you, Henry. Thanks, Barbara. As Henry mentioned, we've been doing this work for a little while now, and we've seen it in action in multiple contexts, and we've seen it successful. We've seen, we'll talk about some of the achievements, but um, one thing that stands out to me is, uh, at one point a partner said to us that public health, we know public health, we've been trained in public health, it's not rocket science. But then the partner went and saw and realized that CBIO is a complicated but achievable methodology that systematically changes the way we approach community engagement. And that really stood out to me is that we all think we might understand what public health is or community-based primary health care is, but CBIO is this framework that can be used across different contexts in rural and urban, in Latin America, in African contexts, in the Caribbean. We've seen it in multiple places. I've seen it with Dr. Bang in uh, Search. I've seen it in Guatemala, and we've seen great success from that. Great. 
what would you each uh, say have been some of the achievements that CBIO has made possible? So um, I think for me, the big, I mean, our partners have talked about the, you know, the huge reductions in child and maternal mortality. And of course, that is no small feat. Um, for me, the, the biggest achievement of CBIO is that you are creating a project alongside the community in a way that they feel that it is their own project. And I also feel that that is no easy feat either, um, to be able to bring in a new idea, um, inspire buy-in, and then make change together um, with the idea that those who are being served by this project can continue it in the long term. I've seen a lot of projects in action, and a lot of projects do not measure their results. Uh, they do. They measure how they spend their money. Uh, maybe they measure outputs, uh, but they don't actually track outcomes and results. And we would not know achievements without CBIO and the principles that guide us. And so the reason we can report on maternal deaths or child deaths is because of vital events and family folders and the details of CBIO. Uh, we don't track just the outputs, outputs, but we also track the outcomes, and that's more important. We all know that we could give 10,000 vaccines, but maybe not touch um, those vaccine preventable diseases. Another key achievement from my perspective of CBIO is social justice. By implementing these programs with communities, as Dr. Banks said earlier, not on communities. By uh, be being true partners, uh, we're able to see sustainable changes. A lot of people talk about this. These are easy words to say. I'm up here saying these words, but it's really hard to do. And it's hard to do at scale. It's hard to do with low cost. It's hard to do for generations, for 15, 20, or 30 years. But that's what our partners are doing. Uh, communities should own the data. Leaders should use that data to make decisions, not heuristics for decision making. And uh, because of CBIO, we've seen both sustainability and evidence. And one thing that you said to me, Henry, a while ago is something that makes Cure America a little bit different is our ability to demonstrate results. So it's easy to say it, but can you prove it? Okay, thank you, Andrew. So uh, Barbara and Andrew both, uh, what would you say are some of the challenges that CBIO presents and the difficulties that come along with this? This is not an easy slog, we know that. Well, um, I come from, uh, I'm going to speak about this from my perspective, uh, working back in the office in Raleigh, so being a little bit removed from our partners that you've heard from already today. Um, for me, one of the most difficult parts of CBIO is the really the sheer amount of data that you end up collecting through CBIO and being able to process, manage, and then share out that data within a reasonable time frame so that it's still meaningful to your community partners. Um, uh, and you know, I say it's a challenge for me, but I know that really a lot of the work goes on um, through our partners in, um, at the project sites. But um, I know, for example, that uh, some of our projects, um, they still use hand tabulation of their data, and they're measuring maybe like 30, 40 indicators through home visits. And so that is a lot of hands-on management of data, and that takes a lot of time, a lot of human capacity. And while you do really have your pulse on the project through that, um, and are able to you know, see needs that appear suddenly and also steer the project to make the most impact, it does take a lot of time and capacity. And um, I don't want to mention a problem without mentioning solution. Here Americas is currently working on a digital data collection system to be able to overcome this hurdle of a large amount of human capacity needed for data management. Thanks, Barbara. I think one of the challenges, of course, is how we fund this. Where do we get the money? And uh, we have to convince people that even with strong data, it continues to be hard. And I think that's because of a persistence in human nature of short-term thinking. Both our political systems and our incentive structures are short-term. Uh, we have an immediate need, an immediate problem. We want to solve that. We want to show people we want to move on. The CBIO methodology is long-term, and so the way that we've solved that problem is by finding partners who share our values of what is health and community health, who have a vision for this shared approach. I think another challenge of CBIO is the industrial complex of aid and how we are all paid here because of aid, 
and how through partnership we need to give up power and give up money, and CBIO does that. Data is power, and by bringing together mothers to lead these programs, we're able to give that up, but can we as a society do that? And that's what's something I think CBIO will push us towards. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, what recommendation would you give to others who might be interested in adopting this approach in their programs? I would recommend that when you begin CBIO, you begin with the end in mind. And when I say the end, I mean like the, the goal of your programs and that you really want to gain that community buy-in. You really want them to be like alongside you as you are working through looking at data, designing the program. And so um, I personally have a tendency to make things too complex, perhaps too comprehensive, too broad, and um, that, uh, that makes it more difficult and it also makes it a little bit more out of reach from um, our community members who are doing this often voluntarily and have other work too. Um, so um, I think, yeah, begin with the end in mind, keep it simple, start small, learn as you go, and um, I think uh, that'd be my advice for myself <laughs> for the next time, so. Yeah, thanks Barbara. I do think that, you know, slow and steady here, we have to have a long-term commitment to this. Um, when I think about what advice I'd give to people is first, we should do it. I think it is worth it. This methodology is proven and is worth it. I do think we need to think longer term. And then I'd also recommend that um, we not work alone. And what I've seen from all of our partners in Bolivia, in Guatemala, in Kenya, and other, in Haiti as well, other places, there are a lot of partnerships that are coming together. So thinking about how to leverage the resources of the community, of the Ministry of Health, of the government, our partners, and that's a lot of work. So that's another component of CBIO that you need is not just um, yourself, but the partnerships that are required. So how do you include the government to the Ministry of Health, and how can you make them look good? One thing that I've seen is that our partners are taking the indicators that are important to our part to the government, so health facility deliveries, and they're highlighting that in their data collection system to show them, look what you did, even if they didn't do it, look what you did, <laughs> because then you can get them to make them look good, and you can have a partnership, and ideally there comes funding and support through that. Okay, terrific. Okay, well, uh, we now have uh, an opportunity for some questions and comments. So if uh, any of you would like to speak up and ask uh, any of our speakers, unfortunately, uh, the ones who presented through recording are not available, but uh, Barbara and uh, Andrew are available, and I can try to help too. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, we have a little bit of time for that now. I do have a question here. To read it. Yep. Yep. Okay, so here we have a question for our Kenyan colleagues. So maybe one of you can come up. Uh, this is from Michael. In Kenya, how did you overcome the issue of fear of misuse of data and also cultural barriers? Can one of you try to answer that? How are you again? Uh, if I can repeat the question, how did we come, uh, how did you overcome the cultural barriers and fear on misuse of data? So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, CBIO uh, itself uh, is programmed to build trust as a first stage. So in Kenya, we have local community leaders local community gatekeepers, local administration. Um, and so before going into the community, it's important to conduct format, formative research uh, on, 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 on what, what will drive the program, challenges that are likely to face the program, and how to mitigate these challenges. That's what we did, and we found the answers in our formative research 
Now, our formative research will involve all the community gatekeepers. By this, I mean the local administration, the chiefs, the sub-chiefs, the ward administrators, and the key informants at high level at the Ministry of Health, the reproductive health coordinators, the county health ministers, and then at the community level, we were able to involve the guides, the mothers themselves, and so we were able to have a holistic aspect about the project and implement the project on a, on, 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 on a point of knowledge on all points, key points, key areas of focus. That's why we were able to avoid uh, cultural myths and perceptions about the project. About data, um, we believe in data sharing. When we went to Kiro Americas, Guatemala, we learned about the Sala situation there. We were able to implement this in our communities through community communication boards. Data sharing is key. When you collect data without sharing that data back, it brings suspicion. So in our communities, we have community communication boards at facility level and at community level. So the community is able to see first and what was collected from them, and that was key. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions yeah, or comments? We have two more questions. And while we're getting to those, I wanted to make a comment. Uh, this, uh, this is a theme that's come up from various presenters, but I wanted to emphasize it, and that is that uh, we can read about CBIO, we can hear people talk about it, but there's no substitute for going to see it. And we've had so many experiences, starting with Ira and uh, Kevin, even Mario going to Bolivia early on to really get a deeper understanding of what's going on and how important and valuable it is. So I hope that Cure Americas can continue to play a role of uh, enabling people to come and learn from its field programs by actually being there. Yep. Okay, we have another question from Michael. I guess it's the same Michael. What would you say has been the most significant failure you have encountered in implementing CBIO, and what were the learning points from that failure? What a great question. So, uh, Andrew, you want to try that? I was going to see if our partners wanted okay, to, Mario sure. or Alma or Ramiro. I'm going to, I'm going to say something uh, while they're coming up. Uh, which is, in my view, one of our major failures has been the fact that we had a terrific project in Liberia that uh, uh, Aristotle talked about that was very successful, but because of our financial limitations as an organization, we weren't able to keep the momentum going. Uh, it has limped along in its own way, but we haven't as an organization been able to provide the support that it is needed to keep it as strong and vigorous as it was at the time our grant money from USAID ran out. Mario? Sí, con relación a la pregunta, seguramente eh, se pueden dar varios eh, fracasos en, en algunas, eh, algunos de los proyectos, pero Para mí el fracaso más fuerte es cuando los socios no trabajan en equipo, como decíamos. Porque muchas veces se puede empezar bien, se tiene una buena visión, pero conforme se va avanzando, como que se generan pues, algunas discordias entre los equipos o las propias comunidades también. ¿Qué hemos aprendido de esto? Pues es, es el mismo camino, retomar ese trabajo en equipo, escuchar mejor, Y seguir adelante. Okay, gracias. Anybody from Bolivia want to say anything? Actually, one of one of the expectations we had while coming here and hear from the experiences of other uh, projects is. Um, to understand, first of all, that perhaps uh, in a more graphic way, in the methodology has some steps, like a circle, but in the practice, um, sometimes the circles is, is very small, 
and you have to perhaps skip one and to go back. And so in, in this case, after uh, four decades in Montero Santa Cruz, we are right now uh, trying to conduct a re-diagnosis of the problem. So sometimes it's quite difficult because in, in, in theory, perhaps you have been completed a circle and you have evaluated and you have many outcomes, uh, very important out outcomes, but the problems are perhaps very mixed. And all, all of this is very related to also the context and the, the, the pandemic, for example, was, has, has been a lesson, lesson learned and that helped us understand that perhaps we need to go back. Instead of finalizing a, cy a cycle, you need to go back and, and to restart again. Okay, thank you. We have a question from a, a colleague and friend of mine from Geneva who works with the World Council of Churches, Moi Makoka, who's very active in the uh, Christian Connections for International Health with me. So, Moi, it's great to have you here. Uh, his question is, did any of you work with churches or faith communities in implementing CBIO? If yes, what were the main highs or what were the main lows? Who would like to take that on? Ann, can you say something? Yes, we worked with churches, and uh, as I told, I said we have, they are part of the gatekeepers. We usually ask permission with, from them because they are in the community, and we have community members who go to those churches. And Kenya is very religious, and so most of the time they give us a free platform to share our workings. And through our workings, they are able to tell us what is not going on well, what is going on well, what we need to add, what we need to change. And that's how we actively work with the church as our partner. Yes. Mario, could you come up and say a word about uh, the relations uh, with churches in Guatemala? There's a strong Catholic uh, tradition and uh, also a strong Protestant uh, tradition. So what can you share with uh, our friend in Geneva, Switzerland about this? Gracias por poder explicar eso. Si yo les comentaba que en el primer proyecto de hecho surgió de la iniciativa de la Iglesia Católica y a través de esto eh, también ellos comprendieron que no necesariamente tenían que cerrarse solo a los católicos entonces cómo esto se compartió con las demás iglesias y que el tema de salud pues trasciende estas barreras religiosas, culturales y políticas por supuesto que esto lleva un poco de tiempo el saberlo eh, digamos entender, pero la mejor experiencia fue cuando surgieron las emergencias, porque en las emergencias no estás preguntando si eres de una religión o, o de otra, y esto nos enseñó bastante. Ok, I'd like to ask uh, Nat Robinson to come up uh, and talk about the work in Bolivia and its uh, connection with the faith and church community there. Um, I'm going to use one example of a collaboration with a faith-based, with, with one of the churches in Bolivia in one of our projects as an, a kind of an example of positive things and the negative things that um, enter into the dynamics of this. Um, and we have uh, a close working relationship with the Methodist Church in Bolivia. And they had, they still have a clinic in a, uh, in a rural town where we worked uh, with them through a five part partnership that included 
um, Cure Americas, it included the Methodist Church, it included the municipal government, and it included the national government, and it included the departmental government, which would be more or less a state government. So um, the positive elements of it were being able to join the resources uh, or, or, or the positive or the, or the possibility of joining resources of all of these five different um, different sources into one effort. Um, the downside of it was that coordinating among all these five entities turned out to be nearly impossible, and so. Um, Cure Americas and the church did not have enough resources in order to carry this forward without the government resources. But the government, but the government, uh, the, the, the church was the only, was the sole proprietor of the health facility in this municipality. And the governments were hesitant about investing money in the private, in the private um, uh, uh, initiative. And so, when, but the the sustainability strategy of the project was for. Um, Cure Americas and church contributions to stay stable with increased contributions from the government. And when that did not, that did not take place, then uh, we were not able to continue. Okay, thank you. Our friend uh, Saeed Arwal from Afghanistan wants to ask a question. So. Uh, uh, Arwal, can you unmute yourself and uh, raise your question or comment? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I would like to, I would like to just, this was a very good explanation and we learned more about us because unfortunately, till now we, 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 we were not able to. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Give him a thumbs up. Yes, go ahead. Every, you're not on camera. Okay. Uh, if you are hearing me, so I I would like to call my question. We can hear you, so go ahead. Okay, okay. So as I said that uh, each uh, presentation and each explanation was very uh, nice and we learned more about the CBIO. But the only question for me sir that is, uh, in, in especially in Afghanistan, we are implemented that CBC or CB is primary healthcare, uh, healthcare CBC, uh, and that is, uh, I would like to understand that uh, most of the things was the CBIO and CBC approach for doing that the similar. So could you tell me what the, what is the main difference between the two approaches? Can you explain what CBT is? I'm not sure we know what you're referring to there. Did you say community-based healthcare? CBIO and CBPHC. Oh, community-based health care versus CBIO. What is the yeah, difference? And, yeah. So um, I would say there are a couple of main differences. Uh, community-based health care is a process of delivering services at the community level, right? So yeah. in that sense, as I, if we go back to the three legs of the stool that I mentioned this morning, yeah. We've got vertically disease-oriented programming, 
uh, service delivery programming, and then community-oriented program, right? So community-based health care is the delivery of services at the, at the community level. It, it doesn't necessarily imply by the term itself that it has a strong level of community participation. It may or may not, but it's the delivery of services at the community level. CBIO obviously involves the delivery of services at the community level, but in close participation with the community in a way that's oriented towards um, measuring improvement in health and using the community to help guide the prioritization of activities. That's not necessarily a part of what CBPHC is, or CBHC. It certainly could, but I would say in virtually all programs, it's not a part of it. Okay, that, 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 that's a very nice thing. I think what I, I understand there are only some small difference between Yeah. Well, we yes. can spend uh, months and years uh, trying to dissect differentiations between, the di between primary health care, primary care, primary medical care, community-based, on and on and on. And uh, I don't think it's that helpful to get too strict in the definitions, but having an idea of what the principles are is the most important thing. But I, I do think that CBIO principles are terribly important in the sense of working with communities to help them improve their health and measuring whether or not we're improving health. That's not necessarily an integral part of what primary health care is, as most of us think of it. Does anybody else yeah, have a... What's that? We are, we, are, we are also following us by your instruction and your, what I, we learn from you from the future generation and all the people for, for the community basic care, these two or three legs or uh, three way partnership, we, we understand that and that's very good. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay, thank you, Arwal. Any other questions or comments? The last question was. Oh, yeah. So we have a question here from Iris. No, Adrian. Oh, Adrian, excuse me. Adrian says, are the data collected as part of CBIO also shared with the Ministry of Health structures? What do they do with the data? My understanding is that NGOs that support communities generally are the main users of this type of data. So maybe we could hear from each of you all about this. So uh, in Kenya, the Kiko project, data sharing is very much key. And um, as I mentioned earlier, at baseline, we had a lot of mortalities that we unearthed that were not in the Ministry of Health records. Uh, a lot of maternal mortalities. Uh, for example, we had four maternal mortalities in our pilot project. And the Ministry of Health record had one mortality. We had uh, 60 infant mortalities, and the Ministry of Health had like 10. So you see this discrepancy caused a lot of issues, and it's because of data sharing that we were able to have a shared vision with the Ministry of Health. It's only through data sharing that you can combine uh, approaches and combine synergies to be able to make impact. So data sharing is very important under CBIO. For us in Kiko, we believe CBIO is a system from the ground at the community health volunteers who are the cornerstone of CBIO, to the Ministry of Health, to the promoters, to the nursing staff. It's a system that all is, uh, is a system approach whereby if one fails, the whole system fails. So you have to share data. Data sharing is very integral. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So uh, if Ramiro and Mario could come up and share from Bolivia, Guatemala. Well, the experience of um, data management and sharing in Bolivia is um, 
has different angles, and one of this is um, something that was uh, it was a kind of success for us because um, the information always um, um, always show what is happening in reality with health in communities. But sometimes the government doesn't want to show that. The government wants to show that everything is okay. But the, the government perhaps is not expecting us to show that the mortality or infant mortality is, uh, maternal mortality or infant is very high. So that was a very, but on the other hand, this information was very important for the people because the communities and families, because they would know that, and they w it, 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 it was a kind of uh, input for them to advocate. It was very uh, strong for them to advocate, to, to ask for improvements to the municipal government. It was a very good uh, tool to advocate. Thank you, Mario. Yo creo que es una muy buena pregunta y seguramente que hay muchas aristas. Vuelvo a decir que con nuestra tecnología que tenemos actualmente, esto no debería ser un problema, pero sin embargo se vuelve un problema. Eh, nosotros iniciamos esto cuando todo era a mano y se tenía que tabular y las famosas salas comunitarias. Y esto ayudó, como decía Ramiro, a que la gente eh, viera estos indicadores y a través de esto pudiera abogar por una por, por mejores servicios de salud y por una mejor inversión hoy cuando ya tenemos la tecnología pareciera que toda esa información está en la nube pero no se sabe qué nube entonces deberíamos de, de luchar otra vez para que sea un sistema lo más único Y lo mejor es que la información, como decimos, vaya de abajo hacia arriba. Seguramente que van a haber choques, pero es una lucha por los sistemas de salud, el sistema de información. Ok. Ok, uh, gracias Mario. It's on, it's on. Huh? It's on. Thank you very much Mario. It's uh, 325 here in North Carolina, so uh, we're going to take a five minute break. And then we'll have a 30-minute session and we'll be through. So uh, thank you for sticking with us, all of you who are still there. And uh, we're coming near the end of our recording in progress. Okay, we've got 30 more minutes to go and then we'll call it a day. I, I wanted to take this opportunity to share what to me are some very interesting uh, parallels between uh, what we do with CBIO and what has happened in Bangladesh on a massive scale. And so I'm going to be speaking a little bit today about Bangladesh as a country, but uh, how Bangladesh got started 50 years ago with these very simple ideas and how they scaled up to have a massive impact nationwide. I'm going to be talking about the Matlab project of ICDDRB, the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, comma, Bangladesh, and also about BRAC, uh, the largest NGO in the world. Barbara, <laughs> my machine is not behaving. There we go. Okay, sorry. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the early uh, history and the development of the MOTLAB Maternal Child Health and Family Planning Program and then talk a little bit about BRAC's Community Health Program and then the national achievements that are attributable to uh, routine systematic home visitation. MOTLAB is a strange name and sounds like some fancy high tech something or other but it's the name of a, a rural community in Bangladesh where uh, cholera has been endemic for centuries. And it became a, a research uh, site in the 1960s that was funded by the U.S. government 
to uh, provide a place where cholera vaccines could be tested. And so the United States military envisioned uh, the need to put their troops into harm's way where there's a lot of cholera and they were willing to invest money in developing a cholera vaccine. And so they created this field site in Matla, Bangladesh. And uh, the purpose of it was to test cholera vaccine. And the way they decided to do that was they created a control area and then an intervention area. And in the intervention area, they tried out new vaccines against cholera. So uh, this was back in the 1960s. Um, and in order to do that, they developed a system of visiting every home every two weeks to register vital events so that they could determine in the intervention area if the cholera vaccine was affecting the mortality, reducing the mortality compared to the control area. And then in the late 1960s, well, uh, this research demonstrated that none of these cholera vaccines were effective which is a very important scientific finding because people thought they were effective and in fact they weren't. But uh, one of the, and this was connected with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. So there were very high powered epidemiologists and very bright people involved in this. And, and one of the very bright people who was involved in this early on was a man named Henry Mosley, who uh, is a brilliant man was sent out there by the Centers for Disease Control. And he recognized that this place had the potential to be an ideal place to test the effectiveness of maternal, child health, and family planning interventions. And so he started uh, a transition whereby uh, they used this system that had been developed for testing cholera vaccines to also test the effectiveness of maternal child health and family planning interventions. And at about the same time, uh, I mentioned before uh, the work in North India of Dr. Carl Taylor and Dr. John Wyan. And so uh, John Wyan did this pioneering field work that was followed by Dr. Carl Taylor's very famous project called uh, the Neringual project, it was one of the first projects to demonstrate you could in fact reduce uh, under five mortality through community-based approaches. But Dr. Taylor's project got uh, pulled asunder by larger political forces. And it's a very interesting story. But uh, at that time, uh, uh, Richard Nixon was president and Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State and the United States was trying to open an avenue into China and Pakistan uh, was uh, aligned with the United States but also had entry into China and so the United States was depending on its relationship with Pakistan to get involved uh, with China and India, on the other hand, was gravitating towards the uh, USSR, the Soviet Union, and then their bloc. And so uh, here was an American health project very close to an um, Indian Air Force base. And the, in the Indian government shut down Carl Taylor's project just because of political reasons. And so his key staff person uh, who developed the community-based component of their work and implemented a woman named Shushan Bhutia. Through the re uh, Henry Mosley was connected to Hopkins, and so he and Carl Taylor were friends. I don't know all the details of this, but somehow through all of this, Shushan Bhutia came to Hopkins to get a master's in public health, and then when she couldn't go back to India, she went to Bangladesh and started the training of the very first community health workers in Bangladesh at a time where there was severe restrictions on women's mobility. Uh, women couldn't hardly leave their house. They could go just around their neighborhood, but they couldn't go anywhere else. And family planning was something that was uh, very difficult to even talk about. But Bangladesh being the most um, 
densely populated country in the world and was facing a very serious problem moving forward of the population growth, it was an important issue. And so uh, Sushimbutia began training uh, local villagers, hardly any education at all, very timid women. She uh, empowered them and supported them to visit every home to promote uh, family planning methods, which were basically uh, birth control pills and condoms at that point, but also to deliver maternal and child health services. So basic child survival work in the home, uh, prenatal care in the home. And so uh, because of the nature of how this was set up with uh, routine uh, registration of vital events, measurement of accurate measurement of mortality, but also accurate measurement of contraceptive prevalence and fertility. This Motlob project generated very strong early evidence of impact of family planning uh, within this population of people. So Motlob, the intervention area had about 100,000 people and the comparison area also had about 100,000 people. And so the international donors came in and saw the success of this program. And at that time, interestingly enough, there was a um, big division in global health over the need to give, give priority to family planning over money for maternal and child health. And the reason was that the, the idea was that if we invest in child survival, we're just gonna create more mouths to feed and worsen the population problem. So we need to give all of our priority into family planning. And so ministries of health across the world were split into two and the international donor money went into the family planning wing and the funding for broader health services and maternal and child health uh, was uh, relatively ne 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 neglected. And so um, as a result of all of this, the MOTLAB program became scaled up, but just the family planning part, not the maternal and child health part. And it became the most successful family planning program in the world. It went national. And uh, Bangladesh has had a dramatic uh, success in slowing population growth, and I'll get more into that in a minute. But uh, in, in Motlob, there are community health workers there who have been visiting every home. Uh, the duration of time between each visit has changed over time and slowly gotten longer. So back in the 60s, it was every two weeks. Now it's every three months, but they still have the same system of visiting every home on a regular basis, recording vital events, and then they also have small uh, clinics. The community health worker will have the people in her catchment area come to her for vaccinations and prenatal care and uh, some family planning services too. So uh, <clears throat> I was just in Bangladesh at the end of May. I had the privilege of living there from 1995 to 1999 and so I had not had a chance to go back for 25 years and I was invited back to give a talk and I'll explain more about that in a minute. But I went back down to Motlob to see what they were doing. And so these are some photographs from there. So their work is still continuing on as a research site, still has the intervention area and the control area. It's focused on maternal child health and family planning work. So this is, uh, one of the, uh, this is the same community health worker I just showed here. This is her home there. And then every two weeks she has a little clinic where she provides family planning and immunization of children and prenatal care. So <clears throat> this is the infant uh, mortality rate and the one to four year mortality rate in the intervention area and the comparison area and Motlob starting back in, uh, if I can see here, 
1978. Yeah, from 1978 to 2004. And you can see here uh, that the intervention area where they had the home visitation program had a significantly lower uh, infant mortality rate than the comparison area. The comparison area was the routine government services. The intervention area was where the community health workers were visiting every home on a regular basis. But you can also see that over time the, the difference has diminished so that as the government services have improved, then the comparison area has uh, reached an area that's uh, a level that's virtually the same as in the inter intervention area. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting example of um, how epidemiological priorities change over time. And so there's been a lot of debate about whether they need to keep this program going because uh, they've reached a very low level of uh, under five mortality. Uh, but uh, it's also being recognized as a place where they can start testing new interventions related to non-communicable diseases and other issues beyond maternal and child health as the epidemiological transition moves forward. So has anybody here heard of BRAC before? So only a couple of you, and I don't know online how many have ever heard of BRAC, uh, but <coughs> It's uh, one of the most amazing organizations in the history of the world, in my view. Um, it started in Bangladesh in 1972 as the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee. Bangladesh has a very interesting and, interesting and complicated history, but it became independent from Pakistan in 1972 after a very bloody civil war. And in 1972, uh, Bangladesh was the second poorest country in the world. And uh, a, a huge typhoon, a huge hurricane came into uh, Bangladesh in, in the summer of 1972 and killed something like 500,000 people just from one storm. And so BRAC uh, was established by a very uh, creative and outstanding Bangladeshi named F. H. Abid, who is, in my view, one of the greatest men in the world. Uh, he started this small organization from scratch, and now, uh, 50, uh, 50 years later, 51 years later, it's the largest NGO in the world, and many consider it to be the most effective and successful NGO in the world. It's now just called BRAC because its work is not just rural. So uh, <clears throat> BRAC began early on a system of community health workers visiting every home on a regular basis. And they developed a dual, what, what I call a dual cadre system of community health workers. The, the lower level of community health worker had six weeks of training and received a very modest salary. It wasn't a salary. She received very modest income based on selling uh, very uh, simple uh, items at the time of a home visit. It might be soap, uh, sanitary napkins, uh, birth control pills, a whole series of things that she was able to sell at a below market price because BRAC would buy these things at large scale and then make them available to the community health worker who would then sell them to her clients at a slight markup and she could make enough money to motivate herself to work as a community health worker. And it, uh, that program grew very rapidly until they had around 80,000 community health workers at one point. The number has gone down more recently. But on top of that, they have a salaried community health worker uh, called a Shasta Kormi. The, the lower level community health worker is called a Shasta Shabika. The Shasta Kormi is a salaried woman with a 10th grade education, and her job is to support the lower level community health worker. And when the lower level community health worker identifies a pregnant woman, then the higher level community health worker comes in and does, does a more formal 
prenatal care visit that consists of blood pressure measurement, checking the urine for protein, and a variety of things like that at a little higher level. And so they have this massive program in which they're carrying out these services and have been doing so for 50 years now. So this is a picture of the three uh, Shasta Shabikas sitting and the two Shasta Corbys, their supervisors behind her. Um, Brack got involved early on in a massive national program of collaborating with the government's TB program. And what they did, uh, BRAC has one of the world's most successful TB programs. And the way it works is very simple. Uh, when a community health worker visits a home, uh, one of the things she asked about is whether somebody in the home has been coughing for two weeks or more. And if somebody's been coughing for two weeks or more, the community health worker collects a specimen in a cup and they have a system for that being collected and it goes to the district where there is a Ministry of Health technician who has been trained to read sputum smears and then makes a diagnosis of whether TB is in that sputum or not. And if the patient tests positive for TB, then the government authorizes BRAC's community health worker to provide daily therapy for tuberculosis that she herself observes. And so this, uh, this takes place for well over 100 million people throughout the country. And other NGOs in other parts of the country has also developed similar programs. So it's a community-based uh, disease control program that's linked to a community-based uh, primary health care system. So here you see uh, a person with the mask on. He's uh, been diagnosed as having TB and he comes to the Shasta Shabika's house every day for his medication and she makes sure that he takes it. Uh, BRAC is moving very quickly into other disease priorities beyond maternal and child health. So in addition to TB, uh, they have a, a massive eye program looking for people with eye problems that can be corrected very simply. And so one of the things they've been doing is they found that a lot of older people can't see just because they need reading glasses. And so they have people who are trained who can screen for eye diseases. And if it's just a simple matter of needing stronger eyeglasses that cost uh, $2 or something like that, then they provide those glasses for older people. If they have other eye complications, then they refer them into a government system of uh, high level uh, eye hospital care that, uh, that uh, there are related to it's an it's an interesting just like the TB program it's an interesting alliance between the private NGO program and the government health system so here you see <coughs> this is a Shasta Kormi the higher level uh, community health worker in Bangladesh and she's making a home visit in a slum and this woman is pregnant and she's checking her blood pressure and she does uh, quite a comprehensive uh, prenatal check that includes not only blood pressure measurement, but checking the urine for uh, protein and a, and a physical exam and so forth. So I wanted to share this with you. This, uh, this is one of my uh, proudest photographs, and I didn't even know it existed until I was in Bangladesh in June. Uh, but... Uh, the man in the center is F.H. Abbott. He's the founder of BRAC, and unfortunately he died about a year and a half or two years ago. But he was a genius in terms of uh, developing and expanding this NGO in a way that maintained uh, quality, uh, high-level supervision, high-quality training. <coughs> and the other amazing thing about it is They've created a whole system of commercial enterprises and income generating activities that pay for 80% of BRAC's budget. So at the same time it's growing massively, they're also generating income locally uh, within the country to support their activities. They have banks, printing presses, uh, 
dairy, uh, dairy products. They teach women how to uh, raise chickens and poultry and milk and handicrafts, and it's really an extraordinary operation. So in, um, well, I, when I had been living in Bangladesh for four years, I nominated BRAC for the Gates Award in Global Health, which was a million dollar award at that time, and they won it. And so there I am at the ceremony where uh, the Gates Foundation won this award that I had nominated them for. And they, I, I uh, was uh, photographed with F.A. Chabot, and the person to the left has become a dear friend of mine, uh, Mushtaq Chaudhry. Uh, who has been the head of monitoring and evaluation for BRAC for many years is world famous, but I don't have time to go into that right now. But uh, I wrote a book when I lived in Bangladesh. I wrote a book. I thought I had a picture of it here. I guess I don't. But when I lived in Bangladesh, I wrote a book called Health for All in Bangladesh Lessons in Primary Health Care for the 21st Century. And it highlights all of the amazing uh, community health work that has taken place in Bangladesh between 1971 and the year 2000, so the first quarter of a century. Of, and by that time, Bangladesh had become world famous for what they were doing. Uh, and then <clears throat> this past year, uh, Bangladesh was celebrating its 50th anniversary, and my friend Mushtaq Chowdhury and 50 other colleagues in Bangladesh have just written a book called 50 Years of Advances in Health. And so I was invited to go back to Bangladesh in May and be the keynote speaker for the launch of this book. And so that was a very special opportunity for me. But uh, this shows you some of the amazing achievements that have happened in Bangladesh over the last 50 years. So in 1971, as I mentioned, it was the second poorest country in the world. It's now a middle-income country and on the path to become a high-income country, which is extraordinary to think about when you go back to where it was in the beginning. Life expectancy has uh, increased from 50 years in 1971 to 72 years at present. The mortality of children younger than five years of age has fallen from 251 deaths per thousand live births. That's 25% of all children, by the way. And now it's only 31 deaths per 1,000 live births. The fertility rate, the total fertility rate, which is the number of children a woman would have if she delivered all of her children at the rates that exist at that particular point in time. So the total fertility rate uh, declined from 6.6 .6 in 1975 to 2, which is below replacement level. 2.2 .2 is replacement level at the present time. The immunization coverage was only 2% in 1978, and it's now 99%. This is a country of 160 million people. Uh, it has the highest usage rate in the world of oral rehydration therapy for childhood diarrhea, and the percentage of deaths of children under five from diarrhea has fallen from 25% in 1970 to 2% in 2000 and has maintained that level. Oral rehydration therapy was developed in Bangladesh uh, through the MOTLAB program, and that's another story I don't have time to tell you about. But uh, my friend Mushtaq Chaudhry, who was in that photograph with me in F.H. Abid, he led a project in the late 80s and 90s. It took 10 years to do this. But they developed a program in which a community health worker, a woman, visited every home in Bangladesh, 13 million homes, and they taught mothers how to use oral rehydration uh, therapy from uh, a simple composition of sugar and salt in the household mixed with water as a treatment for diarrhea, and it changed the national culture and has become embedded in the, in the life of the people there, and it started out through this home visitation approach. Um, I can't read this last thing. Oh yeah, this is the, the high detection of TB cases and the high completion rate 
of people who have TB who start therapy, which is an enormous issue. And, and BRAC and the other NGOs have done a great job of that. So in, in my humble opinion, it's the routine home visits by women community health workers that have been responsible to a considerable degree for this progress. And it really is extraordinary if you think about it. So here, uh, my wife, Marilyn, and I are at the launch of this book uh, back at the end of May. I was on TV and uh, in the national press and so forth. So I was, went in there like I was a, some kind of a high level uh, c c celebrity, which of course I'm not, but it was fun to be there anyway. Um, so uh, I think that Bangladesh in many respects is an affirmation of many CBI CBIO principles at national scale. And Bangladesh is a global leader in improving the health of its population. So it just so happens that out of this relationship and friendship, it became possible for Ramiro Yankee to go to Bangladesh and study public health at the James Grant School of Public Health, which is part of BRAC University. So BRAC has its own university and now has one of the leading schools of public health. So uh, Ramiro didn't know I was gonna call on him, but I'd like for him to say a few words about Bangladesh and its uh, connection to CBIO. Well, it was really, thank you. Well, it was really a pleasure for me, and I was really honored to be there and uh, to know all the history about public health there, and to, to know also because I was already, um, I already had experience of CDIO, but, but when I was there, I saw the CDO in other countries in, in action, so it was really a pleasure for me. I, I came with, with a big motivation um, um, after, and, and I was really uh, happy that uh, Henry helped me go there. So, and and I, I really came back with a motivation that going and, and working with people side by side with people and knowing the value of doing measurement to to see what is happening uh, so it was really less a uh, really lessons learned for me it, it was really important in my life so uh we're running over just a little bit i apologize for that but we have one final video to wrap up uh and so uh, when I went to Bangladesh at the end of May, I uh, had a chance to get to know the Director of Health for BRAC, Morseda Chowdhury, and I uh, asked her if she would allow me to interview her for this uh, workshop, and she kindly did, so I'd like to share a portion of that with you now. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is Henry Perry again, and I am delighted at this moment to have uh, with me Dr. Morsita Chowdhury, who is the head of health population and nutrition at BRAC, uh, which is um, an extraordinary organization, uh, which unfortunately not as many people know about as they should. And so I've always told people if you haven't heard of BRAC, and if you don't know about BRAC, by all means, learn about BRAC. It's got a wonderful website, and there are all kinds of uh, publications uh, about BRAC. It's the largest NGO in the world, and by the standards of many people, it's the very best NGO in the world. It started in Bangladesh uh, back in the early 1970s and is far and away the largest NGO in Bangladesh, but it is now spread throughout the world with uh, programs 
in different countries in Asia and Africa. So uh, the reason that I wanted to include uh, Dr. Chowdhury in this discussion is because uh, I've been aware of uh, the fact that many of the aspects of BRAC's programs are reflective of uh, important CBIO principles. And so I've asked her, I've gotten to know more Seda in the last uh, few months uh, since I was in Bangladesh back in uh, May and uh, had a chance to be with her. And uh, I, I, I would like for her to explain very briefly before we get started in the CBIO principles, something about uh, BRAC's health programs and their extraordinary nature. So, Morseda, first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. And uh, please tell us a little bit about BRAC's health programs. Yeah, thank you, Henry, uh, for having having me. Um, uh, yeah, you already told that um, BRAC, uh, uh, BRAC was born in 1972, and the BRAC health program was um, as an integral part of the of BRAC uh, when it was born. So uh, it was not the uh, the, the form that uh, you can see today, but uh, the um, health intervention was uh, 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 as always as a part of the development. The services to the community, BRAC also tested many models. And one of the model that was successful was through community health workers, because that is with the community and from the community. And that the community health workers were um, eventually uh, emerged from the village organization that is the microfinance group. And they were supposed to provide healthcare services to the microfinance borrowers initially, but later on they expanded the service to the other people, to the entire villagers. So that is how the health program um, expanded to the entire community. So it catered the community need and with the help of the community people. So nothing from outside, only catalyst. BRAC played a catalyst role, but everything was with the community and for the community. So yeah, so that is the BRAC health program. But what, what is the current BRAC health program? So the current BRAC health program is like we have currently more than 40,000 community health workers and volunteers across the uh, entire country. And they are uh, located almost in every villages. And they cater to the mostly primary health care, like prevention. And they identify and screening and do screening for um, minor ailments and provide curative, limited curative care. And then they connect them with the formal healthcare system so that people don't uh, fall in the crack between the community and facility and people, you know, in the um, developing countries, why people don't access the care, uh, even though the services are there. Most of the time, it's lack of information, it's lack of linkage and lack of confidence and and then quality of service. So that is uh, where BRAC uh, community health workers play a role the, to link the community with the facility, but mostly they, they play a pivotal role in prevention and providing limited curative care. So that is entirely uh, like in principle, aligned with in principle with the CBI approach, I guess. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> how many people does your health program serve in Bangladesh, Morseda? Um Currently, um, the our reach is um, uh, uh, fifty six million people, and uh, in Bangladesh but globally it's all together 110 million and um, uh, this uh, uh, out of this 56 million that i have I'm, I'm telling you the number is actually 56 million because we have the uh, digital database of every individual and community health workers are tracking the health data of these individuals regular basis and health workers are digitally equipped so we get regular information and those data gives us the 
also many information including the trend of the disease and what is going on in the community we can analyze in terms of um, uh, epidemiologic trend in terms of demographic trend and we can see also variation in terms of uh, local in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, age specific and seasonality as well and sometimes it also uh, gives us also, um, uh, a trend and we, we sometimes we can predict um, uh, and we are also developing our capacity to um, use this data uh, for predictive analysis so that we can also predict that what is go going to be happen in future for example and now climate change is a big issue and using these data can tell us, would be able to tell us that what uh, would happen um, if there is any heat stroke uh, going to hit the, the country uh, next year, then what um, health um, impact is going to happen and what measures we, we have to take, we can uh, take up front and we can um, um, uh, allocate our resources accordingly. Yeah, visiting home is very critical, um, especially um, if you think about um, uh, people of last mile and marginalized, because they don't prioritize health. So health is their least priority. So uh, people only uh, go to um, uh, health centers when they are severely sick. So, and at that time, it, they end up with lots of um, uh, health expenditure. So that is not what we uh, 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 want to see. So prevention, we want to prevent and um, most and, and, and nowadays, um, the major burden of like other countries in our country is non-communicable diseases and poor people and marginalized people are, 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 are also suffering from uh, are, are the same. So, um, to prevent this, um, um, uh, we have to inform people about this a healthy lifestyle, um, about um, uh, 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 using healthcare services that is free, and also turning to community health workers, um, those, those, those who are free and those who can serve them um, according to their need. So now, if if I um, uh, talk about black community health worker, um, they are basically in the uh, villages they are not uh, known as community health worker they are like two things one is they know they are known about doctors but they are their own doctor because they are their own people and they are selected from that village so that is um that has two types of advantage one is they have trust on her because every community health worker is women and uh, we know that women and children are least served so they need most help so um um women um have like most they they can reach them and they can trust them so they can they the health workers they have the their trust and they can reach the every household um because women have the access to households even just conservative or so they can reach and the second one is that women herself, who is a community, who becomes a community health worker, she becomes empowered enough to uh, suggest or to um, give a decision um, in the community regarding any health issues or any social issues. Because this is how a Black um, empowered them. It's not Black empowers them, basically. It's um, this process, entire process makes them empowered because they are exposed to a wide network and they are part of a network and they understand, um, they, they, they gain lots of knowledge and this is, um, and they also get access to resources because they become an entrepreneur and um, they start earning money, they have access to, and those, Everything uh, all together, they they become um, uh, they, uh, their mobility increases. So so all together, their um, uh, um, uh, empowerment increases, and that also boils down to their um, uh, like edu more education to their children um, and their uh, community 
because they can voice for their kids, for their um, girl child, and that is how societal change um, uh, is made. It's not only health. They talk about other issues as well because uh, community health workers of BRAC, they are not only advocate for health, they are advocate for other social change as well, like child marriage, uh, violence against women. So they become a social change agent and, um, and, and they are equipped uh, to uh, advocate for that. So this is how BRAC makes them a part of the uh, a, a big change. It's not only like an, only an, a health thing, only treatment of something. It's it's a change, entire making a change of the uh, entire community. So health is a big part, but um, I think that community network building is the most important uh, thing. Uh, and bringing community health workers under this network and connecting all the uh, community health workers together, it's uh, it's a very uh, uh, um, uh, important if um, any community uh, intervention uh, um, uh, we want to make, this we, we, we can build on that. So this is the basically the um, uh, 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 it's the pillar of every intervention of us. So this pillar is already there, the foundation. So the foundation is already there. Now we can build on that anytime. So for, for every organization, if the foundation is built, then they can do more majority of the programs uh, very easily. Okay, we've uh, finally reached the end of a long day. So congratulations for those of you who are here still with us. Uh, we look forward to tomorrow morning. We'll start again uh, 8 o'clock sharp. Uh, hopefully tomorrow we won't be facing the same technological challenges that we faced uh, today. We'll be uh, giving uh, time in the beginning to reflect on what we've heard today and it'll be an interactive opportunity for you to make comments and raise questions. Then we're going to spend two hours on the technical, what I call the technical components of CBIO in, in some detail that we couldn't do today. And then we're going to have uh, small group discussions and then a plenary session. So it will be an interactive day tomorrow as well. So thank you for staying with us and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>